Good morning, and we are so thrilled that so many of you have joined us today for the Western Water Conference that is sponsored by the Claremont College's library and as part of our uh, digitizing project uh, that it you'll hear a lot more about today. Um, in the chat, we'll put in the Western Water Archives link so that you can see some of the work that we've been doing over the last several years. Students, faculty, and staff have been working very hard to digitize much of the water collection. It's a vast, vast trove um, that's located here. Um, and it's a unique partnership with um, seven different institutions. Claremont is sort of the hub, um, but colleagues from across Southern California and libraries, big and small, have been contributing. Um, and as it turns out, some of them have parts of a of a archive, and others have that second half of that archive. And it's been a cape. It's been this process of making all of this material more accessible, democratizing the process of approaching these materials, uh, has been central to the work that's been going on for the last couple of years. Um, and as part of that project, we have become um, quite aware. Um, and are glad to acknowledge our host, our real hosts of this event, the Gablarina and Tongva Nation, on whose traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory this conference is occurring, and on whose landscapes uh, much of the material that's in the library has also been uh, focused upon. Um, the quick aspect is we'll, we'll be going from 9 o'clock until about 12.30. There's a series of speakers. I will be introducing each of them before um, they speak. Uh, there will be two short breaks, and I mean short, bio breaks, um, at various points, and we'll let you know when they are um, as we go through this. But most of all, we want you to sit back, listen, and learn a great deal, as all of us have, as we've been working through this project. And I'm, I'll popcorn it back to Kimberly, who will give you some housekeeping. Thanks, Char. Thank you to everybody for being here today. Uh, my name is Kimberly Jackson, and I am the Environmental Analysis Subject Librarian here at the Claremont College's Library. And I'm going to be helping throughout the event by providing support in chat. Uh, so right now, I just want to get started with covering some basic housekeeping for our event. Um, please remember that we are here to gain knowledge and support our colleagues. Therefore, there will be zero tolerance for any unprofessional language or behavior. Um, as your questions come in, they may get lost in chat, so please use the Q&A feature in the toolbar of your Zoom app to submit any questions um, you wish the speaker to address at the end of their session. Um, you can also see that there's live translation um, that's been activated. You can turn that off individually by going to your Zoom app toolbar and clicking on live transcript, hide subtitle. And we also have with us today two linguists, Stephanie and Brandy, who will be signing to interpret for the deaf and hard of hearing community. And thank you to you both for being here. Just as a reminder, the symposium is being recorded and will be made available on the Western Water Archives website after the event concludes. So you can find the video by going to westernwaterarchives.org. We also encourage you all to share the link of the symposium and the video to friends and colleagues and tag us on social media by using the hashtag Western Water Symposium. I'm gonna turn it back over to Char and to introduce our first speaker. Uh, but thank you again, everybody for joining us today. And we hope that you enjoy the 2021 Western Water Archives Symposium. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome to this Zoom conference, Lisa Crane, who is the Western Americana uh, Manuscripts Librarian in Special Collections. But she's so much more than that. Um, as my colleagues across the Claremont Colleges know, she is very active in our classrooms. We come to her for all sorts of information, for research on our own, but also for student research. Um, and she's been the project director for the Digitizing um, Western Water Archives project that we are celebrating today and interrogating in the process. Among other things, she holds an MLA, MLIS uh, with an emphasis in archival studies from San Jose State. Um, she's very active in archival um, organizations around the country, um, and she is a gem of a colleague. So please welcome Lisa Crane. Um, okay, so um, welcome everybody to the 2021 Western Modern Symposium. Um, as was mentioned in our webinar description, this symposium is sponsored by the Claremont College's Library as part of the programming associated with our CLEAR, with our Council on Library and Information Resources, or CLEAR, Digitizing Hidden Special Collections and Archives Grant. 
Our project's official title is Digitizing Southern California Water Resources, but it's more commonly known as the hashtag Clear Water Project. In the next 20 minutes, I'm going to give you an overview of the three-year project, including its conception, logistics, challenges, and achievements culminating in today's symposium. I will also speak briefly of future plans for the Western Water Archives. Conceiving the project. When Special Collections at the Claremont College's library first heard of CLEAR's Digitizing Hidden Collections Grant Program, we immediately thought of our vast water resources collection. The collection contains materials on the subject of water, its distribution, augmentation, and use in Southern California. And due to its size, it's pretty much defied complete cataloging. The Claremont area and its surrounds have long had a special relationship with water, research, with water issues. The city is located on a rather large aquifer that has been the source of water since the Tongva people first lived in the area. The city of Ontario is one of the few cities that gave water rights to landowners when they purchased the parcel in the booming city. Our region's experiences with water in the past and the recent impact of climate change have direct implications for many other regions on a global scale. For example, with rising urban expansion and shrinking agricultural lands, Egypt seeks to farm the Sahara. In China, with the Yangtze River, and India, with its principal eastern rivers, are attempting feats of engineering that were presaged in California more than a century ago, as engineers rebuilt water catchments and mapped and pumped groundwater for agriculture, housing developments, and industrialization. Over the past three years, seven partner institutions collectively have digitized the critical mass of primary source documentation on the development, management, and exploitation of Southern California water and Western U.S. water held in our institutions and have created a digital archive that supports and hopefully inspires scholarship through multiple disciplinary lenses, including public health, engineering, urban planning, legal history, and the array of disciplines that fall under environmental studies. Now that these water documents have been digitized, scholars have immediate access to a rich collection of maps, technical reports, financial documents, photographs, correspondence, and printed ephemera. Taking advantage of digital, visual, and computational tools, scholars can more quickly identify connections and patterns in the records and more easily share their findings in an interactive digital environment. We hope this project is a model for other water collections to employ digital tools that support and enhance questions contemporary scholars and researchers can ask and answer. Here's a sampling of some of the collections digitized under this grant. Noteworthy individuals include George Chafee, Charles Frankish, Willis S. Jones, William Mulholland, Charles N. Perry, Jeffrey Joseph Prendergast, J. Ralph Schumacher, and Frank E. Weymouth. Significant organizations include the Bear Valley Mutual Water Company, Department of the Interior's Office of the Regional Solicitor in Los Angeles, the Feather River Project Association, Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, Ontario Land and Improvement Company, the Pomona Valley Protective Association, the Salton Sea Authority, the San Antonio Water Company, and the U.S. Geological Surveys hydrographic branch. Claremont College's Library S Hub, as Char mentioned. To create a collaborative project, we started to reach out to local organizations which might hold similar or complementary water collections. We ended up partnering with California State University Northridge, or CSUN, and California State University San Rodino, or CSUSB, which are both academic institutions. Municipal libraries, municipal public libraries include Ontario, Upland, and the AK Smiley and Redlands. And the National Archives at Riverside, or NARA, is a federal government organization. 
Pomona College and its foundation relations and strategic initiatives team agreed to be the applicant institution. Logistics. Students were hired at CSUN and CSUSB to digitize their respective materials because Claremont had an existing infrastructure for digital production lab due to the Claremont College's digital library or CCDL and some of our smaller partners lacked equipment and expertise, Claremont hired students to digitize and describe the remaining partners' materials. As a federal agency, NARA could not hire students or staff on their payroll, so we plan to include NARA under Claremont's umbrella. A data dictionary was created and shared with partners to standardize the metadata and include appropriate intellectual property statements from each partner, and file naming schemas were negotiated to minimize partners' adjustments from their traditional file naming practices. We designed the tracking system using material checkout forms to move materials from the public libraries to Claremont and back. All digital objects created by CSUN and CSUSB and Claremont would go into the California Water Documents collection of the Claremont College's library, digital library. Those that had their own digital asset management systems could also put their files into their own systems. Now we'll talk a little bit about our student work team. Beginning in March of 2017 through February of 2020, students from Claremont as well as students from CSUN and CSUSB scanned, photographed, and converted analog audio cassette tapes and created metadata for a selection of materials from 26 water collection Water collection. Students were trained to handle historical documents, utilized an array of scanners and conversion software, creating a variety of file types. Designed the digital objects using Dublin Core Metadata Schema and uploaded their work into a digital asset management system for discovery by researchers worldwide. Students from Claremont were hired under the Library's Claremont Center for Engagement with Primary Sources, or CSEPS program, as Clear CSEPS Fellows. In addition to the technical aspects of the project, fellows were also tasked with writing a weekly pass down, creating a weekly blog entry for the CSEPS blog out of the box, writing social media posts, and giving a culminating presentation discussing their experiences with the fellowship to library staff, project partners, faculty, and their invited guests. And with most projects, you're going to encounter challenges. When we wrote the grant proposal, we used prevailing wage and fringe benefit information available at the time. About the same time, California passed a law raising the minimum wage over the next six years, starting January 27th, right at the beginning of our project. So right at the start of the project, we had to adjust the budget to allow for the higher wages. When you have a fixed amount of funding, and the cost increase, the total number of hours available to work goes down, as does your production yields. Also, about 18 months into the project, the Claremont College's library underwent some organizational changes with the departures of the Dean, the Director of Digital Technologies and Library Systems, or DTS, and the Associate Dean over a three-month period. The new Director of DTS was instrumental in forming a new division within the library called Digital Strategies and Scholarship and digital production was moved from cataloging and technical services to the new division. There was a lot of downtime during this period and equipment had to be moved and reconnected. Staffing for the new unit had to be hired. Newly hired staff encountered learning curves regarding um, student hiring practices at the library and working with the existing digital asset management platform content DM. We originally planned to hire cohorts of clear CSEPS fellows, per, three cohorts per year, one in the fall, one in the spring, and one in the summer, because we wanted to um, provide more job and learning opportunities to more students. But the hiring process took too long and learning curves varied, which affected production. We stopped this practice after the first year and decided to keep students on the project as long as possible. When we calculated the budget, and deliverables, we didn't plan enough time for non-production hours, such as the weekly blog posts and culminating presentations. And of course, with many students, life happens and school happens. 
Our partners also posed additional challenges. One aspect we didn't fully consider was the distance between partners. While Claremont, Upland, and Ontario are centrally located um, near each other, CSUN is about 55 miles to the west, NARA is about 40 miles to the southeast, and Riverside and San Bernardino is about 35 miles to the east. Drive times range from 40 minutes to Redlands to about an hour to CSUN without traffic. Now, of course, when is there no traffic in the Los Angeles area? It was difficult to hold meetings in person, and since this was pre-pandemic years, Zoom wasn't even on our radar. Finding students willing and able to travel to NARA was near impossible. In addition to the distance, conflicting digitization and availability policies created unnecessary delays. Coordinating and moving materials between Claremont and Ontario, Upland and Redlands posed physical custody challenges. Working with the large CSU schools, we found ourselves working with enterprise services instead of payroll accountants or other financial staff to generate invoices. Individuals so far removed from the project that it took a lot of work to get the correct information. Also, metadata had to be created by librarians and or metadata specialists. And despite the presence of, presence of a data dictionary and file naming schema, organizations with different digital asset management systems sent their meta metadata and files in non-conforming formats, which required extra work to normalize. Achievements. As we came to the end of the grant period, we have reflected upon the fruits of our efforts. Despite several logistical challenges, we were successful in digitizing 26 collections, either partially or completely, of the 31 collections we set out to digitize resulting in over 137,700 pages and images scanned and over 12,800 digital objects created. Over 10,000 new or enhanced metadata records and almost 4,000 new controlled vocabulary or authority records were created. Additional online content include over 180 social media posts and over 300 blog entries. To date, the contents of the California Water Documents collection from the start of the grant period till now in the Claremont College's digital library have had over 50,000 page views. Future plans. One of our crowning achievements was the development of the Western Learning Archives portal, which was launched in summer of 2020. I'm hoping some of you were able to peruse the Western Water Archives website when you registered for this symposium. If not, I hope you take a few minutes in the future to do so. Perhaps you might even bookmark it as an additional resource for you. Currently, you'll find more details about the contributing partners, the collections digitized under this grant, and the Clear CSEPs program. Collection tiles are hot linked so that a single click will bring all of the items digitized from that collection to your results page. There are pages addressing conditions of use and accessibility, and you can easily contact the Claremont College's library using the form at the bottom of the pages. In the future, the pandemic put a stop to the flow of files from our remote partners. As Southern California begins to reopen and staff is allowed back to their offices, we hope to resume receiving files digitized pre-pandemic to be ingested into the collection. The Claremont College's library will continue to digitize its water archives materials and add to the collection as resources allow. As for the Western Archives portal, we will be adding additional pages the culminating presentations from the Clear CSEPs fellows will be added to the site. A digital toolkit page will offer the project data dictionary, training materials, forms, and non-proprietary grant application materials. A scholarship page will contain project-related presentations and workshop materials from the 2018 American Society for Environmental History annual meeting, student posters from the Western Water Archives poster showcase that will be held this spring and in the fall, and ideas for course assignments, just to name a few scholarly examples. Of course, the recording from today's symposium will also be available through the site. We're open to suggestions from any of you as well. We want the Western Archives to be an abundant and overflowing water resource to students, faculty, and researchers worldwide.
Thank you, and I will take questions now. Thank you, Lisa, so very much. Um, it's kind of amazing how much has happened in the last several years. Um, I mean, the data that you were showing is a little bit mind boggling. But I, you know, while we wait for questions to come in, I actually would love to hear um, any documents that sort of surprised you that are in this collection where there, I mean, you gave us the overview. Is there any sort of palpable story, some, some significant document that you didn't know was there? I think one of the things that um, was really most fascinating um, and I can only really speak from um, our student um, CSEPs fellows um, because they're the ones who are working with the documents on a day-to-day -day -day basis, and, um, and I wasn't, um, right. was the letters from um, the um, Ontario um, City Museum, um, the George Chafee letters and other, and other handwritten letters. Um, I used one of those letters on one of the um, slides. Um, they're really fascinating, um, the books that they were in, the way the, the letters were um, created, the way the letters were preserved, um, made it difficult to digitize them. Um, but it was really interesting just to hear what people were, were talking about at that time about water. Um, we've also had several students who were able to really make connections between the materials that they were working with and their um, um, home countries. In fact, there was one student who actually came from India and um, he did his culminating presentation um, comparing a lot of the water issues that were going on that he was digitizing with some of the stuff that he was experiencing firsthand living um, in India. So making those connections and seeing our students make those connections were really fabulous. Great. Well, there's a bunch of questions, the first of which is a good one, and I know, I think I know the answer to this. Um, have we approached or been approached by um, Los Angeles DWP, which also has a huge collection? No, I have not heard from them. Oh, I thought we had had a conversation. I'm sorry. Early on in the grant, in the grant period, um, our digital project manager, Tanya, did take several of the CLEAR um, CSEP students down to... Um, I believe it was the MWD, the, the DWP, um, to look at some of their archives and things along those lines. And um, our students at the time really counted that as a highlight of their experience. Good. Um, Chris Wright asks a question about whether the archive will expand to include Northern California water delivery systems that obviously carry a lot of water down to Los Angeles as well as the Colorado River. Um, again, I mentioned we're open to suggestions and we're open to talks and we're open to um, hear uh, feedback from folks and anybody who might be interested in collaborating in the future. Yeah, and actually we have a lot of material on the Colorado River. We have uh, engineers reports, blueprints for, for what is it, the Parker Dam um, yeah. and other really, I mean, my students just dig into that because they're absolutely fascinated both by the engineering feats on the one hand and the sort of um, imperial nature of such projects. Uh, Marcos Huertos asks if there are records of the relationship between indigenous people in Southern California and these water resources, and if available, he'd love to know what's been found and what's missing. <laughs> what's missing is a lot, unfortunately. Um, as most people are aware, there are a lot of um, silent voices in the archives, missing voices in the archives. And um, that is um, one of the unfortunates with the materials that we're working with right now. There really isn't much representation um, in there. I do know that that's something that um, um, Janine and Catalina, who will be talking later, um, are working on trying to bring more of those materials in. And I do think that that's something that we really need to um, work closer with um, the Tongva elders who are um, uh, regularly on the Claremont College's campuses and try to get some of those more, more materials in. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Dylan McDonald wants to know, was there an attempt to partner with UCR and its archive? Yes, that, yes. What, UCR was one of the first people that we um, reached out to. And unfortunately at that time, they were going through a lot of upheaval and transition in their organization. Um, they were missing people and things like that and um, missing people in positions. And so they, pretty, they politely just said, um, they just couldn't take that on at that, at that time, which was fine. Um, um, we still refer people to UCR and their water archives. Um, and it is something, it is a collaboration that I do hope we'll be able to work on in the future. 
Yeah, it's a really rich repository. Um, I found material in there concerning a dam in, South, in San Antonio that um, no one knew about. So I feel very fortunate um, to have had that connection. Uh, Vanessa Wolf asks if you have any sense for how many of what fraction of the sources are legal and or court documents? Um, that's a really, really good question. Um, there is a good amount of legal and court documents. Um, I know that special collections at the Climate Causes Library, we do have a lot of those. I think those are some of the ones that um, we wanted to digitize but didn't actually get to them. And it is something that we will continue to do so. Great, thank you. Um, and Madeline Glickfeld asks, um, indicates that she's really interested in the evolution and growth um, of irrigation districts, the movement of water across this landscape um, and the sourcing of those, those institutions because as she notes quite rightly, many of the 200 water systems in LA County uh, have been in existence since the late 19th century. And what kinds of, what documentation of that do we have? Irrigation systems, irrigation districts, we pretty much just have um, um, the documents from like the Bear Valley Irrigation um, Organization or Irrigation District, um, some other water irrigation districts and defunct water companies. Um, so we've got records from them, um, but most of those are going to be from the late um, 1800s, early 1900s. Yeah, great. Thank you. I mean, and that's a problem with archives. You have to sort of wait for people to give you stuff. Um, and Dylan sort of follows that question up by um, wondering if there's a way to leverage additional donations of collections, uh, given what we've done, is there a way to sort of go after more, particularly these irrigation and water district uh, records? Yep, special collections is known for its water resources collections. Um, it is something that we're act we actively continue to add to whenever possible. Um, so if any of you know of any archives out there that are looking for homes, please don't hesitate to contact me. Yeah, in case you missed that, we'd love more. Send exactly. them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and our colleague Lee Lieberman, um, thanks you for the wonderful overview and wonders if you could say a bit more about the materials being used to supplement coursework at, at the colleges and how, how faculty and students are um, engaging with them. I think that's something that, Char, you can answer better. <laughs> uh, well, I will say, Lee, that, that my students in every class, every semester are in that archive. Uh, Lisa gives this beautiful overview, and then they start digging through materials that she's pulled out. You know, back in the day when we could do it in person, we were in the founder's room digging through material. Um, and then they write uh, really beautiful essays framed around um, whatever the document that captures their eye. It could be a photograph like that great photograph of that maniac on his bicycle trying to pedal through the 1938 flood, which would have been me had I been around at that point. Um, um, and, and, and or because we have a lot of material around water around Claremont, that seems to strike their interest because it's, it's literally the land they walk through. Um, and it gives them a deeper sense for the community that they are here for four years or so. Um, and so my sense is it's been a, um, certainly for me as a teacher, and I hope for the students uh, ex as, as an experienced part of thinking about archives and how to use them, uh, I, I suspect in many, many cases, it's the highlight of the semester and it happens in the first week or the second week. Uh, Brian McNeese asks, uh, do you have any records images relating to the meetings of the League of the Southwest and its discussions of the Boulder Canyon Project Act prior to its passage? League of the Southwest doesn't not quite ring a bell, but we do have a lot of materials regarding um, the Boulder Canyon Project. Um, we also have, um, um, election um, campaign materials to pass the, the acts for the Boulder Canyon project and that sort of thing. Um, but the leak of, that doesn't ring a bell with me. Great. So there is much more for us to discover in this, in this archive and much more for us to think about water in Southern California. And we're now going to uh, shift and thank Lisa very much for her presentation um, and cue up the second one from another colleague uh, in Claremont, uh, Heather Williams, who is a professor of politics at Pomona College, um, but also a very valued colleague in the environmental analysis program and the international relations program. 
Um, she's the author of two books, uh, Social Movements and Economic Transition, Markets and Distributive Policy in Mexico. And the second is Planting Trouble, the Barzon Debtors Movement in Mexico. And she is currently working on what is, I can't wait for it to get published, Heather, so get going, um, a book on the what's called the uh, River Underground, The Secret Life of the Santa Ana, one of the great watersheds in Southern California. She's published widely in journals and in book chapters. Um, and today we're going to hear a bit, I think, about the Santa Ana Project. Uh, and so Heather, thank you so, so much for your contribution. Um, and the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Char. And thank you, Lisa Crane, for putting this together and to all of you who are have um, made the Western uh, Water Archive available to us. It's a treasure. And uh, it's just, I, it, I feel really honored to be a part of this conference. So I'm gonna share my screen uh, to, um, so that you don't have to just uh, stare at my uh, face while uh, uh, you know, on the screen. And so maybe we can look at some images. So again, uh, it's such an honor to be here. And um, I am really pleased to, uh, to present my presentation today, um, When Water is Money, Drought is the Taxman, Tales of Boom and Bust on the Santa Ana River. So about a million years ago, uh, when I was first hired at Pomona College, it was actually in 1998, I had this magnificent uh, adventure driving the country in this car, a little Ford Escort. And I tell you, I miss those days, right? When um, I, I had no housing uh, as I was finishing my dissertation. So that a car was my home with a little tent in it. And um, I was coming out from the University of Pennsylvania where I had had some soft money for a year. And um, I, uh, Found my life, you know, mostly in campgrounds or on a on my laptop, perched in a waffle house or the wraparound porch of a friend's mountain home or picnic tables in campgrounds. I had a tent, I had a cook stove, sleeping bag, and all my possessions in the back of that car. Um, now I, I cannot imagine <laughs> how large a truck I would need for all the things that I have accumulated. Uh, in my life. Um, but one of the most magnificent finds of this pre-Pomona adventure was as I drove west, uh, I uh, dipped down from the highway driving west uh, to the Kebab National Forest on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And uh, a great deal of it actually has since burned. Uh, but at that time, a lot of the forest was intact. It was beautiful. I woke up after settling in my sleeping bag at night on a clearing off a service road. And I found myself in a meadow of wildflowers with deer grazing just a few feet from me. And like so many other visitors to the US West, you know, I thought I had found my private paradise, right? Going to the Grand Canyon at dawn. And I spent a day hiking the canyon and writing my diary and sketching. And, and just concentrating on really, really looking at the land and uh, feeling expansive, I browsed in the National Park bookstore uh, with and and with some money I didn't really have. I bought this book that looked fascinating. I have to confess I judged it by its cover, which was so intriguing. Cadillac Desert, Mark Reisner. And of course, I had picked up one of the kind of classic readings of Western water. And I remember going back to my little um, uh, Ford Escort campground and uh, just being absolutely fascinating. And um, I, I thought I had been really doing nothing but looking at and falling in love with the land, especially the wide open spaces that opened up in Kansas and turned to Rocky Mountains and the Sangre de Cristos and the red rocks around Gallup and then finally this beautiful Grand Canyon. But um, essentially like Reisner said something that should have been obvious to me that wasn't, right? Which was that wherever you see people in the West, you know, past the hundredth meridian or wherever you see industry or mines or towns or yards or orchards or farms, there was water being wheeled to it. And it was, now 
Reisner's book is a classic because it has great shaped the views of millions of people in countries around the world about water in the US West. And it's one of those books that's both very good and in retrospect, deeply flawed. Um, and, and for me, one of the great tragedies is, is Mark Reisner's um, uh, passing uh, at way too young an age in an accident. Um, and, but I think that this book is a good starting point, both for what it conveys, but also um, some of the, the, the axioms about the West that I wanna push back against. Um, so essentially Reisner's arguments, if I can sum them up accurately, was first of all, that the limiting factor uh, to agriculture and large scale settlements west of the 100th meridian is precipitation. Second, he argues that despite the warnings of you know, great surveyors like John Wesley Powell, who were sent west to, to essentially assess its suitability for large scale settlement, he said, you know, government should limit settlement and administer the West through units corresponding to river basins. And uh, despite the fact that he that people said this, public officials treated the West as a territory that could be settled and farmed as it had been in places where water was abundant. Um, irrigation schemes abounded, right? And most of them failed. Grifters gamed the system and got rich from land and water grabs. And then finally, colossal failures in irrigation ultimately led to big water, federal government funding and uh, it, large scale projects, um, followed by the state of California or here in Southern California, the Metro, sorry, Metropolitan Water District, sorry, um, typo there. And, it, and the idea was, right, at least Reisner argued that uh, it benefits mostly the benefits mostly went to land barons and rich developers and the environment suffered as well as taxpayers and rate payers. So anyway, um, these are all, I think, important uh, arguments and Southern California is certainly part of the West and of the US, um, US West after the US Mexican war. And the story that most people learn about the region is one of original sin, right? The water heist by the city of Los Angeles, um, uh, conveying, uh, did I, sorry, I think I skipped something. Oh, sorry, I skipped a page. So essentially what I do wanna argue, right? Going back to Reisner is that in fact, right? I mean, he, he does point out right, important things, right? About the West, right? You think about, um, you know, uh, Horace Greeley's utopian town ended up in, in giant battles with Fort Collins and Boulder. Um, aquifers were tapped out in the Central Valley of California and speculative uh, wheat ventures in uh, Western Oklahoma and Kansas turned to dust uh, in years of little rain with the prairie torn up and soil pulverized by a single disc plow. And you also had giant lawsuits like with um, uh, Lux v. Hagen when Miller and Lux went to battle uh, with their cattle um, uh, empire against the uh, farmers who wanted to irrigate, put, pitting riparian code against appropriative law here in California, uh, resulting in actually uh, a great deal of confusion. And, and then of course there were the huge mistakes like the um, irrigators in the Imperial Valley uh, who, um, who thought that they could get ahead of that river and its silt, but made a mistake, a flood year happened, the river changed course, ran backwards and created the Salton Sea in one giant uh, two-year kind of calamity. Um, so um, I think there was no game at which the private sector won and lost so spectacularly as at irrigation in the US West. And so Southern California is certainly part um, of the story of uh, US West after right, the US Mexican war and the story that most people learn about the region is one of original sin, right? That um, the, we learn about the water heist of uh, the city of Los Angeles conveying the Ovens River from the Eastern Sierras to Los Angeles. And um, you know, you often hear the lament from people in, in Southern California that we're living in a desert, but we don't recognize it. We shouldn't live like this. We shouldn't take our water from other people. 
And um, I think this story of stolen water uh, dominates the region, the narrative in the region. It's our kind of original sin. It's our original noir. Uh, and it's a story told very well by Reisner and before him by influential journalists like Carrie McWilliams and retold in the fictionalized treatment by Roman Polanski in Chinatown. And, uh, and, and I think it's an important story and it's not untrue. I think that big water uh, explains a lot about uh, who gets water and why uh, here in California, whether it's the Bureau of Reclamation, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, the Metropolitan Water District, or the Department of Water Resources of the state of California, who together, really amass resources to lift great rivers out of their banks or to build high dams and aqueducts and power uh, and, and power transmission. You know, um, I think big the story of big water, right, I want to argue isn't all wrong. These are powerful agencies and they serve powerful clients, cities, big utilities, powerful landowners and developers. Um, but the story of small time folly leading to big Western state Chinatown, if you will, um, is I argue a parsimonious, but only half true story about how water works in Southern California. And if we take time to look carefully, right? Um, and and to, to use resources like are now available to us with, with the Western water archive, we actually see that there are other stories, right? That, that are, that also explain who gets water and why and how it has shaped uh, landscapes and economies. And um, if we actually start to look also at uh, local water development, we can come out with a better idea of where our water really actually comes from, where it's likely to come from more in the future, how and why it's managed the way it is, not by a single large entity necessarily, but here in the Inland Empire, uh, if you count up all the agencies and um, entities that have something to do with water, it's going to be somewhere around 200. Uh, and it, we also basically see right how right, who has claims to it and why. And there has been a spectacular interplay of land speculation and audacious engineering of booms and busts and lawsuits and landmark settlements. Uh, but um, they're not the ones that are represented in the movies, and uh, but are rep richly represented by the Western Water Collection. So, when you think about uh, where our water comes from, um, I would also recommend you know people who have bucked the trend of like thinking about uh, only big water, the Met. California Water District, the Bureau of Reclamation, people like Steve Erie, who wrote this beautiful book, Beyond Chinatown, which is a second look at the Metropolitan Water District, or William Blomquist's uh, great book on groundwater called Dividing the Waters, which actually looks at the, uh, the big groundwater basins of South, Southern California and the emergence of big lawsuits that um, that essentially created self-governing water masters uh, that correspond to the units of um, uh, water districts. So when you think about where our water comes from, uh, now you may think that it's all coming from the Colorado River or the Feather River up north, but here in Claremont, where I'm living, if you open up the tap, about half of that would actually be coming from the San Gabriel Range. Uh, and um, east of here, uh, you would have places where virtually all your water is coming from the San Bernardinos. And so by following that water back uh, historically, uh, I think you can get interested in this river that doesn't look like much from the road, or even if you were to take a hike along it, it seems like a fairly modest little flow. It's called the Santa Ana River, and it runs 96 miles from its um, headwaters in San Bernardino's to the, uh, to the sea between Newport uh, Beach and Huntington. And uh, it's, but it's a big watershed, it's 2,600 square miles. And uh, it actually has um, very capacious aquifers because a lot of our geology here is sedimentary. These mountains are fairly new and they are steep and they are eroding fairly fast in, uh, in uh, 
geologic terms, and that leaves lots of pore spaces beneath our feet. And it may be of interest to people to know that, say, the Orange County aquifer over here is actually the busiest aquifer in the world with more uh, conjunctive use of it, i.e. use of it, uh, uh, with um, storing imported water, but then also extracting the water that's uh, produced from it, from uh, both put-ins and takeouts. Uh, it's the busiest in the world. And I want to tell you just one interesting story about this river that I think will help us understand um, something, a real world outcome. And it's a tale of two cities uh, in uh, in the watershed. Uh, one is Redlands right here. Sorry, my shape went the wrong place. And the other is Moreno Valley, about 12 miles uh, south of it. And to, these cities were developed by the same man in the, 19, in the 19th century. And yet uh, with the same plan, the same uh, irrigation source uh, to water the orchards, and yet their fortunes could not be more different. Uh, the city of Redlands today is one of two outlier cities in an overwhelmingly working class uh, inland empire that's really dominated um, uh, mostly by the logistics industry outside Claremont and um, uh, Redlands. And it, um, so Redlands is known for its wide boulevards, its museums, its historic homes, the white collar jobs at the University of Redlands or at the Esri campus. Uh, it has um, a, a, about 30% higher than average household, mean household income, uh, it has twice the nation's average of uh, bachelor's degrees. And it stands very much in contrast to its twin city developed by the same man, uh, which is Moreno Valley. And Moreno Valley is, um, I wouldn't say it's doing poorly, but uh, it has about twice the poverty rate of uh, Redlands. You can see just from its, uh, its external appearance that water rights are far more dear. It's a, uh, it's a city that, um, that thrives very much on the logistics industry and on low wage jobs in warehouses. And, um, uh, it's, it has about half the nation's average in terms of um, uh, college degrees. And so one city would rise in prominence in the 1890s and through the turn of the century as a gracious green Arcadian home to millionaires and gentlemen farmers. And the other would become a kind of desolate city on wheels where a few hardy alfalfa and dryland wheat farmers would remain and where development eventually would come courtesy of the United States Army and Air Force and then later the logistics industry with its warehouses. So the story I will tell you in brief is taken from a, a book that as Jer says, I'm writing and I never seem to finish, uh, but where I point to a time in Southern California history in the 1880s, which I argue is a pivotal time in the making of the built hydroscape of the region. At that point, just 30 years uh, into statehood, uh, it wasn't clear what this region would be. Uh, you know, while a, there was a sense of destiny that permeated the place, um, fueled no doubt by the gold fortunes and merchant fortunes of San Francisco and the Sierras and the ephemeral wheat fortunes in the north, wasn't at all clear where big money was to be. Uh, people who arrived uh, on the new lines uh, built by Southern Pacific and the Santa Fe railroads were charmed, I'm just checking my time, uh, by the balmy climate and sunshine. Prospectors climbed the, combed the mountains and found modest bits of gold. There was cattle, there were remnant parts of, um, sorry, I think, um, of the California ranchos, the missions had been dismantled under the Mexican under Mexican rule, the asistencias were mere memories, and most significantly, the people to whom this region belonged and who had managed these lands through fire, hunting, gathering, seed selection, and trade. The Tongva, the Luiseño, the Cahuilla, the Chumash, the Cupa had been killed, had been displaced, starved, subjected to vagrancy laws, and convict leasing. It was a time, sorry, I'm moving. Right, it was a time of 
right, of sh shepherds, of grifters, of cowboys, of uh, convict labor, of would-be developers, of tight-knit groups, of colonists, of utopia builders, hobos, and vagrants. It was also, interestingly enough, a place where thousands of people were coming in hopes of surviving tuberculosis and mental illness, a bundle of pathologies referred to at the time as neurasthenia, believed to be the product of the speeding up of life with the age of the telegraph, electric lights, streetcars, the railroad, the factory. And Southern California, a land more imagined than understood by doctors who sent their patients west, might with its broad open valleys, sunshine and slow pace of life offer some respite from illness. So it was a combination of sunshine, uncertainty, a lot of empty land, emptied land, um, most importantly, that was too dry to re re reliably farm from rainfall that gave rise to what ultimately would be Southern California's most profitable industry ever, selling itself. Um, if Southern California in reality little resembled the found paradise that the railroads and the boosters promised, right? There were people who, right, who seized on the idea that with a little ingenuity and a whole lot of engineering, right, that it could be made into what it was advertised at. And so um, I want to turn to a man named Frank Brown, who arrived at age 21 just out of Yale. Uh, to San Bernardino in 1877, who was any number, um, it was like any number of the people at the time who embraced this idea. And what distinguished Frank Brown from others who put together land ventures and places with romantic names like Redondo Beach or Alhambra or Ray Rosedale, and at first largely failed in initial rounds of land development and hasty lot sales, was that Frank Brown, and Claremont was also a failed colony at first, uh, was that Frank Brown, um, along with a stockbroker he met shortly after he arrived, um, uh, Frank uh, uh, Judson, um, uh, Edward Judson, right, um, was that building a paradise, a really saleable paradise in the vicinity of San Bernardino, was at that time, you know, along with the Riverside Colony and Pomona in the West, the only settlements of consequence uh, in the Inland Empire, he realized he really needed water. And frustratingly, though there was a snow-capped mountain range above the town, the river and um, the river that drained it, the Santa Ana and its tributary Mill Creek, were all uh, very modest and fickle flows and were all at that point completely claimed under law under appropriative doctrine. So Frank Brown kind of um, comes along and he changes the game, he becomes convinced that there's more water in the river that meets the eye. He sees the steep slope and deep alluvium in this new mountain range, and he makes a bet. He, he convinces his stockbroker friend Judson and local bank uh, Lewis Edwards that he could tap that water with new forms of engineering, and that the three of them could make a fortune buying dry land, subdividing it, pairing the land with a certificate promising water delivery, and then selling it at a multiple of the original price. What could possibly go wrong? Well, actually everything. Um, Judson and Brown, starting this in 1880, initially needed enough money to actually uh, embark on this engineering. They didn't quite have it. Uh, they bought 1,500 acres in a moonshot, subdivided the land, and released it at auction, promising people water they didn't yet have. Uh, and then Brown set about um, trying to find it. Um, they had made big mistakes. They underestimated the price of buying water from existing rights, which was actually doubling each year. Um, a miner's inch of water that in 1877 uh, would be valued as, as a right at $25 would go for $800 a decade later. So everybody was hanging on to their existing surface rights. And they also dramatically underestimated how much water each acre would need. So I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna convert this into acre feet because it's easier. 1500 acres would really actually need about 3000 acre feet. And they had rights to about 300. And so 
in order to keep the people who'd already bought plots of 10 acre land, 10 acre plots of land uh, from suing them, uh, Brown steps into engineering mode with one year of engineering degree underneath his belt. Uh, he tries harvesting wastewater from the river. He decides he's going to drill pipes into the river bed. He does this uh, and gets, um, he, di he digs straight at a cost of $30,000 that he's borrowed. He digs uh, into a distance of uh, 600 feet and a depth of 21 feet into the river bed, tunnels around it. He uh, ends up in total still with about a thousand acre feet of water a year uh, from these schemes and realizing that this guy was going to go broke. He does the ultimate thing that is kind of unimaginable at this time. He decides that he will, he's bragged about this to William Hammond Hall, who was a great surveyor of California water in 1880, that he said, right, like the water up there in the mountains, we can capture it. He had been, he had never actually seen uh, a dam being built of any kind, uh, but he had read about it in books and he became convinced that um, after scaling the mountain with a local rancher, um, a guy named Barton who had become uh, wealthy uh, from claims in the Holcomb Valley up in now, uh, what is now Big Bear, uh, that he could dam the headwaters of the um, Santa Ana River at Bear Creek in the Holcomb Valley, which is a bowl that's created by Sugarloaf Mountain and what Gold Mountain and Mount San Gregorio. If anyone's been up to Big Bear, you'll understand that that is a big bowl up there. And uh, Frank Brown decided, look, um, if we're going to capture all of the snow melt or much of the snow melt coming off those mountains, there's no way we can afford to build a gravity dam that weighs more than that water. What we're going to do is use this new idea about compression in a curved arch dam. He convinces people to lend him $360,000 in an 1884, goes up, to the dam with a hundred workers where they um, uh, are um, essentially uh, molding this structure from 1200 pound granite rocks that they are mining at the site using Portland cement, uh, wooden sleds to move all of this around paying workers 15 cents an hour and they build this dam. And what's remarkable is it's eight feet wide at the bottom. It's about three feet wide at the top. And that winter, um, when, the, when it snowed, it snowed a lot, 94 inches of snow fell on San Gregorio Peak tw two times the average at that time. Uh, his um, Brown's Estimates had been for half of that because they believed that the average was what they had to calculate for. This water weighed 7,000 times more than the dam. And it may be the most extraordinary risk anyone ever took with water engineering. And despite all the reasons it might well have failed, it did not. And so uh, this was the ultimate test of concept. Uh, and now, Brown had the right, not just to his thousand acre feet of water that he had bought and figured out from wastewater, he had the right to 25,000 acre feet of water. And it was, it made him into an instant celebrity, not just in Southern California, but uh, throughout the country, he was written up in newspapers and in engineering journals. Uh, it was later actually called uh, by an engineering uh, guru, the finest, uh, most audacious uh, structure ever built. It was uh, hailed by the Los Angeles Times as the eighth wonder of the world. Um, I think I'm just about out of time. I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, but anyway, at any rate, right, Frank Brown becomes a celebrity and he becomes convinced that he cannot lose using the science of irrigation 
to make plenty where there is scarcity and becomes convinced uh, that he uh, sort of is, is an anointed man whose mandate is to greatly expand his empire. He has now at this point irrigated 20,000 acres. Uh, Redlands emerges within three years to become an incorporated city and a playground of millionaires. What's interesting is that the orange groves that they grew um, were not what made Redlands one of the two richest cities in America for a brief time, along with the city of Riverside, but instead that the orange groves, which were producing a fruit that didn't yet have a market, seemed so much like an earthly paradise that the right, that people with money were coming out to California to settle as millionaires in these kind of bucolic rural settings to escape their neurasthenia, of course, all of the orange groves were tended by foreign labor and convict labor, and they had electricity from the Mill Creek um, hydroelectric um, facility that they built. They had wide avenues, and so they had all the urban comforts without any, uh, uh, all the rural comforts without uh, any of the uh, having to forego any of the urban uh, luxuries. Uh, even the Southern Pacific, no, the Santa Fe Railroad even built tourist spurs going through the Redlands Grove so that they could sell these pre-made homesteads at $5,000 a piece, which in today's uh, money is somewhere around a million a piece. People were buying them straight off the train. And so you had um, mansions and heiresses that came to mark the Redlands lifestyle. And it was on this celebrity that in 1890 that Judson and Brown um, decide that they will greatly expand their empire. The only problem was that they, um, they didn't have enough water rights. And so they decided if science worked the first time, it'll work better the second time. They decided to double the height of the dam and increase the irrigable space to 100,000 uh, acres. They bought land in what is now Moreno Valley that was south of the San Timoteo Badlands and the Box Spring Mountains. And, and it was a really audacious long distance water haul. Uh, they decided that they would sell shares to raise capital for $1 million uh, in, in capital that they were selling in Chicago, New York, New Haven, Glasgow, London, Geneva. And then they sold uh, shares in the land, oftentimes on credit to people, but wanting to churn the stock price. Uh, they, um, they also got the new landholders uh, there to... Um, to incorporate under the Wright Act to issue bonds for the cost of the actual water infrastructure that went there. Uh, and instead of taking the money that came from the shares to put into the water company, they actually uh, paid the shareholders dividends each year 15% on the face value of their shares in order to try to pump the stock price. It was in many ways the first subprime mortgage uh, fiasco uh, that, um, that the world would see. Uh, and interestingly enough, it occurs in Moreno Valley, which would also become the most affected zip code in 2008 and 2009 in the subprime mortgage crisis then. I don't think they're quite linked, uh, but I think that there is a kind of willingness of the world continually to, to buy into this brand of Southern California as the land that can't lose. And it, that, it, it happened in, in 1892, and it happened in 2008. But um, despite the boosterism, um, the the and and the churning of bills, uh, you can actually find in the Honold Special Collections a lot of the bills that were issued to the Bear Valley Irrigation Company, and along with notes in certain cases to pay them essentially with certificates uh, in the land company. So there was a tremendous amount of right, um, uh, paper that was changing hands instead of money. And ultimately what happened to the system was that uh, even though they were able to make improvements on the dam, um, Brown couldn't make water. And in 1891, a set of uh, a multi-year drought set into the region 
And instead of the dam being able to deliver water to 100,000 new acres, it actually could, couldn't even deliver to the 20,000 acres in uh, Redlands, uh, a huge uh, set of a, an enormous amount of litigation ensued that took over a generation to settle. It absolutely ruined Frank Brown and it basically sent Moreno Valley, um, which is now it's subtly named after Brown, but Alessandro as it was called then, and Paris into, a, um, into about a century of, over a century of being a backwater with only a couple of thousand people, dry land wheat farming and alfalfa, and propelled Redlands into a city of considerable wealth and prestige. So um, with all of that, I would like to conclude to, uh, conclude by saying that this account suggests several things, that water may be gold, but in value, in its value, but unlike gold, um, it's a poor medium of exchange because while markets right in the human imagination assume that water in a stream like gold in a vault will always be there in the same form in perpetuity. Nature has other plans for us. The rain sometimes doesn't fall from the sky and our actions change where the water is and what can be done with it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heather, so, so much indeed. Um, um, Frank Brown is uh, kind of a seminal and a seminal figure and also a, a byword, a cautionary tale, uh, mm -hmm. as you've nicely done. We do have some questions. And so let me get to those uh, now. There's uh, one from Annie Davis about whether um, the Spanish did any acequia irrigation, zanja, uh, off the Santa Ana during the Spanish occupation. I assume that's on the lower river, perhaps. The lower river, yes, uh, and the, you also have the Asistencia that is up in the on the Lugo Ranch. So the Lugo Ranch is granted uh, right um, under the Mexican rule, uh, but the Asistencia was essentially an outpost for a lot of the livestock of the right. San Gabriel Mission. And so, yes, there was um, a channel that actually irrigated from Mill Creek, hmm. and yeah. That it, which was an easier shot if you think about it, right? Where Mill Creek, it's sort of you it you can do the gravity more easily than the Santa Ana River, uh, certainly off. Um, so uh, which is just trickier because of that huge boulder field. But um, right. yeah, there was a Mill Creek. Um, and do you know uh -huh. during during the Rancho period under Mexican occupation? Um, I know there was a ditch in Claremont running from the canyon towards. Um, uh, Palomaros's ranch, um, yes. but it, was there similar kinds of structures elsewhere? Do you know? Um, you would have had um, in Santa Ana, what is now Santa Ana, uh, you had um, a Zanja system. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but they were still fairly small scale. Um, they were, so yes, the Zanjas existed and, but it was actually, you had a pretty major expansion of it in the headwaters of the river where, because remember, right, you have the river that a lot of the year would be nearly dry, right? right? It would sink into the alluvium and it was this funny river because it would, you'd also have rising water at certain points. So it kind of rise in the artesian fields just uh, north and uh, I want to say east of what is now Riverside. And so you um, you also have things like artesian fields uh, right. down right here in um, uh, in Claremont. And uh, but but so those those were important. But I would say that really you have the development of a Zanha system that's more complex under the Mormons who arrive right in uh, very briefly, right in the right. Uh, 1850s. And then you have, um, you know, Myron Crafts and others who are gonna take over that. Um, and also Barton 
uh, it was Hiram Barton who bought out a lot of their lands very cheaply because they were called back to Saint to Salt Lake City because they were doing crazy things like holding seances <laughs> and doing like highly heterodox stuff out here. And so they were successful irrigators, but unsuccessful Mormons. But yeah. their their irrigation, I think, then gives way to the South and North Fork uh, uh, Ditch Associations uh, in right in what is in what is now like San Bernardino Mentone uh, area. Good. I have two more questions, actually three. One from Harold Eaton, wondering if you know about um, Frank and Carmen Austin's early 1890s newspaper, the Moreno Indicator, uh, which was a promo. Like many of these towns, I think she's saying no. Uh, Austin was I'm also Mary down. Austin. Yeah, was also Mary Austin's brother-in-law. Uh, and was a partner of Fred Eaton, all working to divert the Owens River um, from Eastern Sierra down into our area. Um, and Madeline Glickfeld has another question related to Brown's Dam. Like, how did he get away building a dam on a river whose riparian rights were already appropriated? That or were they? They were, right? So at that point, right? So um, presumably, right, when they open up the gates, right, you have the senior rights holders who are right. going to get, right, the, um, right, their share. But the idea was that if you store, if you have this big reservoir, essentially, you can open those gates in the driest part of the season and create a greater flow. Right. Uh, and so I think that was the deal. But certainly was, senior rights holders were senior rights holders. And they, right. um, yeah. Yeah, the goal was to great get question. more than than what the senior right holders could take, right? But it's an interesting question because it shows how little people understood about how a dam might affect the hydrology of yes. the river. They didn't really understand, right, where the water, right, like why water, you know, became surface water when it did at the volumes that it did. They understood, right, like from wells, yes, there's water underneath our feet, but they really didn't understand right. They didn't know, you know, what, like, um, how basins worked, uh, or how surface water and groundwater were, were, were related. So um, that they actually found out through lawsuits when people would be digging right. wells and somebody with surface water was sure that they were being encroached on, but they didn't have the science yet to prove it. So, right. Um, this is, a, but it's a great question. Like, why yeah. didn't they just sue him then? Right, right. So two more questions. Let's, if we could have some quick, because we've got a break right now. Uh, one of which is coming from Mark Los Huertos. Um, the progressive era that was about to begin uh, after Brown were these progresses, was this progress? Was this just another sort of um, robber baron uh, perception that began to define some of the ideology of the progressive era. How did people 20 years after Brown think about Brown? Um, I think they would have thought that, right, that he was, he was an out of control, <laughs> uh, that he was an out of control guy, right? Like admiring him in some ways, right, for his East Coast credentials and, sure. right, for, uh, for his, you know, he was a civic minded guy. He believed in Redlands. He was a leading citizen there until he really went bust. Uh, and so, but yeah, ultimately they believed that, right, that government and bureaucracy and oversight and regulation were important parts of this. And right. this damn well could have killed people. I mean, yeah. like, my God. No, no right? kidding. No right? kidding. It's, it's amazing that it didn't. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, good. And the final question uh, brings us back to an issue that we've been threading all the way through, um, and that's about the indigenous peoples of this area. Were there um, irrigation projects that they embarked upon? Were they manipulating the flow of water to facilitate their use of a landscape that ultimately would get obviously expropriated and, and reconverted to something else? My understanding is that by and large, right, the river served as riparian trade corridors. Right. And so that, you know, people like had much greater use for what the river would produce in terms of its um, rate of the um, useful plants, the oak groves, right, the um, the pastures. So with fire management, like people were uh, using also things like um, 
vernal pools uh, yes. to in, in managing right for to replenish vernal pools for uh, more for better hunting uh, ground. But there was, I mean, the the irrigation itself was pure drudgery, right? And uh, and people who understood this land better had no need right. to, to engage in settled agriculture. Right, right. Good. Well, thank you very, very much, Heather. We're going to take a quick break. Um, we'll get back here at, um, uh, what are we going to do? 10, 15, 20, 10, 20, uh, which is like really quick. So let's make it 20, 10, 25. Um, and uh, we'll hear from Sammy Malouf uh, from Cal CSUN. And we look forward to his talk. Thank you, Heather, again, so, so much. It's pretty clear that Frank Brown in Redlands could have used a conversation with Dr. Sammy Malouf from CSUN. As you'll see from his biography, he is very interested in environmental fluid mechanics, water quality, turbulence, transport phenomena, stratified flow, surface and groundwater flow, and contamination. Many of those issues uh, were um, beautifully um, revealed in Heather's talk. Um, his current research focuses on modeling the fate and transport of contaminants in groundwater and around coastal waters, an issue of enormous concern in Southern California. He's a professor of engineering in the Department of Civil Engineering and Construction Management at California State University, Northridge. And it's a real honor to have you with us today, Professor Malouf. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. It's a great honor to be here myself. And I wanna thank everybody, especially Stephen from uh, my school, our school and Char and all these unsung heroes, especially uh, the ladies who are uh, covering this in uh, sign language. Uh, certainly this is a, a great uh, feat. Uh, a greater feat would be to communicate uh, to everybody in, in this venue. And uh, it's quite uh, resilient, I would say, given all the uh, hypes and, and the pandemic and, and everything that shut down. In this talk, I will cover just a very brief uh, reconnaissance, I would say, uh, on, uh, we, we're going too fast with the slides, what is going on right now, but uh, we'll give some history. Uh, naturally, I'm dwarfed uh, in, in, in comparison to the previous talk, and I want to thank Dr. Williams for the beautiful overview that she had uh, given us until now. Uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Brown would not like me to, to, to bring it to char, but uh, we'll, we'll find out at the end. Uh, simply put, I'm going to go over uh, uh, starting out from a globalized point of view to go to uh, the individual, because this is what matters. You know, we, we revolve around our consumption and uh, we will take it uh, hopefully to the Q&A at some point. Uh, you know, unlike the times when uh, folks came into this beautiful uh, terrain, California, uh, the population has, has just uh, jumped uh, so high in the recent, uh, you know, last century. So I can uh, show you, for instance, during uh, uh, Mr. Brown's time around here, the population on Earth was, was very little if you compare it to today. But, you know, let's say around 2 billion people. Now we're approaching about 8 billion human beings. And of course, uh, along with that, we have a lot of domestic and, uh, you know, other animals that uh, require water, an essential matter that uh, keeps us all alive. So the distribution of water, while is, uh, you know, outdated, I would say, in today's standards, uh, has a great uh, deal of uh, potential for all of us to be involved. And uh, ironically, if you look at this map here in front of you, most of us uh, prefer to uh, live around uh, coastal uh, plains and uh, coastal zones in that uh, about 70% uh, of people live more or less around 70 kilometers away from the coast, if not on the coast. So you find these mega cities, maybe if you look at the West Coast, 
of the United States, you will find, uh, you know, maybe this is in Canada, Vancouver, Seattle, and Portland, and three major cities, San Francisco, LA, and San Diego, all coastal, a uh, little less uh, folks inland, but uh, this phenomenon is all around the world. And this requires us to, uh, to really deal with uh, a great deal of uh, perhaps adjustment to bring water in as we do in Southern California. A recent survey, I usually give this every time I teach uh, hydrology for engineers. Uh, I asked uh, all my students in the class to monitor their own consumption for one week. These are samples from the class. Uh, the, all the units are in gallons. The table came from the US uh, Environmental Protection Agency, so didn't create that. And uh, I was surprised how much consumption every individual in uh, the class that I teach uh, basically uh, attains. And uh, this is another one, a little larger, 1292 gallons per week. And uh, this one is a little sensible, 649, 558, and so forth, you know, 800. It varies a lot. So I thought I'll make this uh, a little chart here for you. That's the individual weekly consumption in gallons per uh, a student at CSUN. And in a representative of uh, many human beings in the Southern California area. And uh, it's, uh, if I convert this to say, uh, you know, daily consumption in US gallons, I would see about, uh, you know, a range between say about uh, 150, at least uh, the least amount is 62, perhaps you can see it here. And these are gallons. So I put a little image of a gallon here to, to really uh, convey this idea to the students. And then I converted all this to uh, liters. So it turns out, you know, once you, you shrink the size here and you change the unit, uh, some folks start thinking, wow, I, I consume so much, you know, 578 liters uh, per day. And that's, uh, you know, in a sense, about uh, three or four times more than an average individual consuming in, say, Frankfurt, Germany. Same folks, you know, in, uh, in somewhere else in the world take about 122 liters per day. Uh, my beloved students averaging around uh, more than close to 400 liters per day. So uh, this, this kind of brings us uh, to uh, an interesting discussion. You always hear about the agricultural field the taking all the water. Well, while it does, but it seems like it's an individual uh, subject matter that really needs to be uh, addressed. So uh, this chart here uh, shows Frankfurt uh, as a, you know, a residential total of 122 liters per day per capita per person. And uh, a total including industry and agriculture would be about 20 liters more. Take LA, for instance, uh, it's mostly around this, kind of coinciding with the data that uh, I averaged in the slide prior. And the industry and agriculture and what have you augments about 100 plus uh, liters per day. And this is mostly a recent type of survey uh, from the sources that you see at the bottom of the slide. If you look at the slide on your left-hand side, we are number one. We seem we pride ourselves to be number one in many things. Uh, this is definitely in the case in freshwater withdrawal. We take about uh, 41, 41 liters per day per person on an average uh, from nature. So this, of course, includes all the uh, industry and agricultural venues. And if you compare this to, for instance, to uh, say Germany again it will be about four times more than Germany. And these are all, uh, most of these countries are industrialized uh, people living there and uh, enjoying, you know, proper hygiene and uh, they're uh, replenished every time. If they're thirsty, they have water to drink. So they're not fetching water from somewhere and suffering a great deal. So th this is another 
alarming point that we need to uh, focus on when it comes to money. And I believe the previous talk highlighted why most of these guys went after water. It seems like they wanted to uh, quench their own uh, capitalist hunger, I would say, as opposed to the, the, the thirst of the uh, uh, you know, inhabitants or uh, constituents who were there. They invented cities. They didn't solve a problem of a metropolitan. So this is a very uh, strange setup, I would say, at least to me, coming from a very old land. I didn't have to think about that growing up, you know, how to create a new city. But one thing I, no I noticed looking at these uh, sources here, if you look at, uh, again, Germany versus the US in this manner, you see a reversal in the pattern in that Germany's consumption is very little, but the cost of water is quite high per liter or per gallon. And uh, if you look at the US, it's exactly the reverse. So the consumption is quite high and the price is reasonable but compare this to canada and you know another new world and you see you see that they have even more consumption but uh, luckily to them have more access to to water than you know semi-arid lands such as the region we live in and yet the price is quite reasonable as well and uh, this is something to to think about you know i'm not here advocating to raise the cost of water but maybe to to deal with it somehow in a in a good way uh, looking pictorially at the regions you know on the left hand side we see the hydrological plains or zones and we live in the area where the circles are you see that uh, there's uh, some precipitation not so much and a little runoff uh, you know just, just uh, under some management and then on the on the other hand if you look at the right hand side the 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 scarcity of rainfall versus the population centers can also start make you think like uh, why do people do that to themselves you know why do they come to an area where there's hardly no water and of course the solutions to that uh, were in the past you know tap into the groundwater aquifers as we had noticed in the previous uh, presentation or perhaps bring water from elsewhere to here so uh, bring water from elsewhere to here will be covered uh, in, in a couple more slides, but uh, just to address groundwater in a very extreme extent, you look at the slides here and look at this fellow, you know, professor of sort who came in back in the late seventies to the San Joaquin Valley to kind of survey how much the land had subsided over the years due to the over pumping from the area in, in this uh, zone, uh, you know, close to Modesto, I would say, and uh, in, in, in some areas locally as well, you will find a great deal of subsidence that uh, took place uh, as we had emptied out the aquifers. So even relying on groundwater is not really a sustainable matter. And uh, evidently so, if you keep pumping, you will invite the uh, the seawater or coastal water to invade you and uh, the, your aquifer will be somehow uh, polluted with uh, highly saline or hypersaline water so you start feeling the taste over here or you need to treat it even more uh, just as a general notion the uh, you know not to talk about technical stuff so much but uh, just as a matter of comparison uh, seawater has about uh, 30,000 uh, parts per million of uh, mostly salts, and your uh, tap water has about 500. So you can see between 30,000 and 500, there's a great difference. And if you uh, are thirsty while you're sailing, please do not drink any water from the ocean, as you perhaps already know. Now, in this slide here, it shows uh, three major projects that kind of replenished uh, LA. Of course, I, I thank also the previous professor's uh, discussion that uh, highlighted uh, micro similar projects conveying water from some faraway land 
to a center that is now bustling and uh, finding the opportunities uh, that, uh, you know, making some folks extremely wealthy and making a great deal of people suffer. So uh, the, the first uh, photo on your uh, right-hand side, the upper right-hand side is the uh, Owens Valley feet as they may have uh, celebrated uh, in about a hundred years ago. And then the, the one below it is the Colorado River, or so just a snapshot uh, of it. And finally in the uh, you know, 60s, 70s, the other feet that took water from the north and brought it down is the uh, California aqueduct. Uh, of course, all three of them, you can notice that uh, they're open to the sky, uh, passing through uh, a great deal of uh, hot areas. You know, we are, uh, you know, as they call it, the Mediterranean zone, uh, semi-arid to arid uh, region of the world, and a great deal of evaporation along the way take place. So there goes millions of gallons or liters, if you want to start shifting the paradigm, gone back to the sky. And you, while you may, you may say, you know, it's okay, I, I beg to differ. You know, this this is not a sustainable way to, to live. And uh, then, you know, you hear about the geniuses coming in uh, with the, the desalination uh, point of view. It's, it's a proven technology. It started out uh, in the U.S. As a matter of fact, even uh, Thomas Jefferson, the late president, wrote about it, uh, just desalting water for the naval fleets. He didn't really think about it as very large scale. But uh, of course, capitalists and uh, geniuses of sort that, uh, you know, couple their companies with uh, stockbrokers and what have you, thought about it from a business point of view, you know, while you can sell it to the public as a, a drought free technology, they don't tell you the whole picture. And in, in essence, I'll bring you just parts of the picture to you because I don't want to bore you with technicalities inside. After a great deal of about, you know, 60 or 70 years of uh, distillation and desalination, researchers found that reverse osmosis or forward osmosis now would be an, uh, a more feasible type of technology in that it costs less. That's all. It still costs considerably more to uh, bring water from one place to another, but uh, still it costs less by comparison to other technologies that desalt water. So in essence, you bring water from the sea or the coast, you know, in the ocean, and you pass it through uh, some kind of high pressure pump. And then there's a osmosis a train that uh, removes the salt and uh, captures water. And we call this clean water a permeate or fresh water. And then in reality, if you go quickly in the process, you can take out the salt and dump it back to the ocean. So the permeate goes to the city and you enjoy after treating it, uh, drinking it. And then the concentrate goes back to the ocean or the sea. Now look at uh, the two photos you can see they, they're exactly a copy. It's not because I'm lazy. Well, I am in one way or another, but I, I simply put this together to prove to you that while this coastal plain is a source, suddenly it's a sink. And conveniently it's put here uh, at the top. So it is the source of this schematic. And then suddenly it becomes a sink. So what really happens within the process of desalination? Uh, there is a great deal of intake. So uh, along with the seawater, you can see this uh, cartoon of fish sometimes is going in, impinging because of the actual uh, you know, suction pressure that is required to bring water from one place to another. And then this goes along with the other microorganisms and uh, sea life to the actual plant for processing. Of course, once... Uh, this is done, uh, the brine or the concentrate, as you see, as you saw it in the previous slide, is dumped back into the ocean, hurting marine life. One uh, really bad thing about reverse osmosis, for example, as a technology, is that it sends out uh, some kind of plume 
there is a, a hypersaline twice the salinity I talked about earlier. So if this is 30,000 uh, parts per million, uh, this would be 60 to 70,000 parts per million. This kind of like a light blue line that's coming down, hurting naturally, uh, you know, bottom feeders and uh, marine life in a great deal of pain. Uh, this is uh, some kind of schematic as to, uh, you know, a plan view of sort to, to make you realize um, how destructive the zone can be within the ocean. Notice that this plant will take the water from somewhere close by, otherwise it will cost a lot of money to build. And little by little, this zone will probably grow, and then the plant will require far more thrust to, to deliver exactly the same flow that it was designed for. So this is not a very sustainable technology per se. And uh, maybe a, a, some kind of isometric view to elaborate more on the idea. If this is the plant and the intake uh, brought some water in, the effluent or the, you know, the outfall, if you like, will send the plume down. And notice how it plunges down to the bottom and then keeps going until it dilutes completely and becomes part of the ocean. So this zone here is, after a while, will becoming a dead zone. So emphasizing more that this technology is not necessarily a sustainable one. Uh, you could say that, well, you're showing me schematics. What about real pictures, you know? So I thought I'll bring you a real picture. This is a far more adverse way to dump the uh, hypersaline effluent. You can see this plant here in Oman. Uh, I hope they're installing uh, an outfall at some point soon. It dumps the effluent immediately at the coastal line. So by doing so, uh, the, uh, the dilution part will take a lot longer time because as you probably know, swimming along the uh, coast, uh, this area is very shallow. And as you go deeper into the, uh, deeper into the actual uh, sea, then the uh, water becomes a little deeper. And then of course the, the mixing may become uh, more, more effective. Another uh, successful between quotes plants uh, along the Mediterranean coast, uh, where I'm originally from, the Eastern Mediterranean, is uh, at the city of Ashkelon uh, in the state of Israel. And they do the same thing. They dump all the hypersaline water uh, into the uh, the coastal coastal plain without any outfall, and you can see here during some kind of backwash, a colleague of mine there sent me this uh, horrendous photo. You know, this is an invitation to also uh, harmful algal blooms and and adverse problems, just in the name of kind of augmenting the supply system with more water. Naturally, you can determine that this is not a sustainable way in the long term. What is sustainable is what we're seeing nowadays, you know, to, to really start using recycled water a little more. If you can really tap into uh, the, the portfolio that you currently have, you know, open up the tap or just, you know, as you take a shower, maybe you did that earlier before this uh, discussion, you will find out that most of the water you use goes away, just about maybe 90% of it, if not a little more. So, and most of it is what we refer to as gray water. That's useful for a multitude of things. So if you start individually adjusting, for instance, your plumbing system, taking the uh, you know water you get out of the shower and storing it for flushing the toilet, that's a good start. That you will save substantially not only on your water bill but also on the environment and, and other things. Other matters you can have maybe a little pseudo treatment facility within your household and then you can irrigate the beautiful lawn that you have. Keep in mind that you know while most people who came here with these big dreams you know to embrace uh, California's gold. Uh, they came from somewhere, most likely it was very lush. You know, I heard the, the uh, 
Dr. Williams talk and she started from Pennsylvania. You know, it's completely different climate moving west and then you probably passed by the desert and what have you. And they never consult with locals, people who really know the land for perhaps hundreds of years. And uh, they instead, you know, took the audacity to, to invent something that is similar to something else. Mr. Mulholland, you know, is, is revered as some kind of hero, hails from uh, Ireland, a completely different climate, a lot of water there too, a very arid land and, you know, conveying water from hundreds of miles east of here to LA, for instance, it's, it's just in today's world, not only is it unsustainable, but it's perhaps, I hate to use words such as ridiculous or laughable, but uh, these come to mind. And uh, forgive me for being so audacious in, in words, but words just hopefully are the triggers to some action later on, and not a revolution, but a water evolution. And I really hope to, to work on this uh, for the rest of my life. Now, uh, continuing on this, if you, if you see the, the plant that really takes water from your wastewater, you know, it has some sludge and what have you as you flush the toilet, it reaches it to a great level, you know, secondary of ter or tertiary level. In, uh, in today's standards, you know, pristine enough for me and everybody else to really drink that. Of course, you will uh, have the taboo of drinking wastewater or, you know, the idea about thinking where this water originated from. But then if we pump it, you know, we recharge it in some kind of uh, aquifer. We replenish the aquifer, monitoring the quality, of course, and all that, and then let it go for a few months, you know, six months or what have you, and then, you know, bring it back, reuse it. We will be doing this earth a great favor. And that's one arena out of many, and I'll discuss a holistic way at the end of the talk. But, uh, you know, in the 1950s and what have you, if you remember looking at channels, both in the, the dry in the previous slide and then this one, you will see that it is cement line or concrete line and it conveys water so quickly. So it rains, it takes it out from the street, uh, this, this kind of storm system, storm uh, management system, and then sends it very rapidly to the ocean. What about if we start thinking ecologically about you know some better future? So for instance, if you have a little ravine or a stream or saqia as, the Arabs and the Spaniards uh, refer to, why not uh, make it as natural as possible if we're not using it for irrigation purposes and what have you. Just here, so it replenishes some kind of local plants ecologically and also feed the groundwater aquifer underneath it. So you can really start a new development like this one with the idea of making the, the, the drainage channel next to you something of, of uh, value to, to the habitat around you, because after all, we share this planet with a great deal of other creatures. We're not the only ones. Now, uh, my hope is to bring down the uh, individual consumption to around 122 liters per day per capita, or perhaps less, we can beat Germany. You know, I mean, if they can do it there, maybe we can do a better job here or as the LA DWP had done to cover open uh, the reservoirs by simply putting white balls on top of the re reservoir and they float and eliminate a great deal of evaporation in terms of uh, you know high temperature neighborhoods if you want to look at it from you know some kind of plot uh, the csun hope is to bring uh, the, uh, the curves down very close to the 122 baseline that we had uh, aspired to do. And maybe in, in a couple of years, if I'm invited again, and I hope somebody else from my the school comes in and you know give you some good reports on this, uh, I'll be happy to, or someone else will be happy to report on this, that we have uh, brought down individual consumption uh, two or three times. Uh, less. And uh, overall, you know, a great portfolio 
of water does not strictly depend on ocean or brackish desalination. But this is the last sort of it, and that's why you see it here at the lowest level. But rather, if we are efficient using a great deal of conser conservation, you know, we never forget drought, we don't forget the land we're living in, and also start using more effectively recycled water and shift the paradigm to a less taboo as to where we come from. And then, of course, conjunctive use was mentioned in the previous uh, discussion, along with other, I would call them ancillary, ancillary uh, help to really make our life livable. So number one, it starts, and I will end uh, at this moment, starts with me. It starts with you. Every time I flush the toilet, I make sure that this toilet is a low flushing toilet and I control the flush if it's number one or two accordingly. Every time I wash my face or brush my teeth, I don't need to keep the water running. Uh, I use an efficient dishwasher. You know, these little measures, you'll be surprised how much water you save and hopefully the goal of 150 or maybe 200 liters per day per you and me will be very soon uh, accomplished. I want to thank everybody for listening and uh, uh, all the time is uh, devoted uh, uh, to you. So I'll be happy to answer all the discussion questions that are out there. Thank you, Dr. Malou, very much. That was really wonderful. And I think it does a dovetails nicely with Heather and with talks to come in terms of the way in which you talked about our current state and the, as you said, laughable nature of moving water at such remove to ensure that a place like Los Angeles or Phoenix or Salt Lake City or wherever, um, all of whom have benefited from cheap water and cheap energy and those two things come together um, to make the Southwest an extraordinary place for human um, life but it does seem strange that it's the desert that's doing that. So I really am greatly appreciative of your comment. We have a number of questions, so let me get right to them. Uh, so everybody knows we're gonna absorb the second break so that we can keep as close to on time as possible. Um, we've got, uh, let's see, oh, I just disappeared it. Um, the, from an anonymous uh, attendee, um, why don't desal plants hold the brine in tanks and or bury them uh, more like nuclear plants um, than flushing it into the ocean. So unlike uh, nuclear plants, and I want to thank the listener who brought this question up, this is a steady state uh, operation. So you intake, and there's a conservation of mass, if you like. The intake and the outflow must kind of play together uh, a little dance. So, uh, you know, storing brine, uh, maybe in tanks or even removing water from that brine and storing salt would be a very massive operation that would be cost prohibitive. So uh, the simplest and yet uh, perhaps most economical operation within this uh, desalination uh, feat, if you will, is actually to dump it back into the coastal zone. So uh, as, I, as I mentioned, you know, I'm not anti-desalination uh, from a technological point of view and all that. I actually, you know, wrote a couple things on it and uh, how to maybe minimize the uh, dead zone that we have talked about. However, let it be the last resort within a, a very diverse portfolio. If you're anonymous, I don't know what you do, but I assume that you live here and you perhaps invest in the stock market or what have you, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. This is as simple as it is. Keep it from that economics point of view. You probably diverse your portfolio uh, financially to have some investments in one place, others in others, and, and maybe in the future of your children or, or your offspring. So always keep in mind that we are ephemeral. We live here you know, a very short period of time and this earth must be delivered to our successors, hopefully in a better shape, not worse. So I want the planes 
and, and the coasts and all that to stay as clean as possible. Always keep in mind, if you really think that the ultimate sink of this earth is the ocean, we might as well keep it clean. And thank you. Great, that's fabulous. Uh, from our colleague and friend, Sheila Pinkel, uh, wonders that if we do divert gray water um, to our lawns, out of our dishwashers uh, in various ways, uh, what happens to the ability of contemporary sewer systems to work um, if they're not getting the flow that they were designed to receive? That's an excellent question. And thank you, uh, Ms. Pinkle, Professor Pinkle, I have to say, and congrats on your uh, recent uh, retirement. Uh, she is an influential human being in my own personal Indeed. life yes. and a wonderful human who cares. And that's that's what matters the most. While we can keep a balance between, you know, the, the design of wastewater uh, treatment facilities that are constantly under, you know, rehabilitation, refurbishing and expansion due to population growth that, you know, you've seen a slide on it, how it exponentially expanded at the beginning of the century on of last century. Uh, we can always, you know, think about this from a holistic point of view. Do we really need a very massive wastewater treatment plan? And if so, if the operation requires that, we can ask consumers who be, you know, our constituents to release some more into the into the wastewater so it doesn't shut down and, right. and lose business. And I'm I'm sure the gray water modification that you will do in your house will still contribute a great deal of uh, of uh, wastewater to the plant itself. And will not, uh, you know, uh, you will not go off grid completely. Good, thank yes. you so much. Um, another question from Vanessa Wolf wonders if there is anywhere in Southern California, maybe CSUN, that offers continuing ed hydrology courses for landscape designers and architects. I want to thank her for this question, and you know, I don't, I don't want to brag so much, but we recently have started out a master's in sustainability. And uh, I invite her and others to join at some point, you know, in the capacity of a cohort and what have you, and you learn a lot. You're more than welcome to attend also seminars that I give on hydrology, especially now we're on Zoom. So uh, for someone who's interested, my email, I think, uh, can be easily accessible. And I'll give you a Zoom link. You're welcome to attend uh, my engineering Sweet. hydrology class. Sweet. That's lovely, thank you. Uh, Mel Boynton um, asks a softball question because he knows the answer. Um, whether the Cadiz water project out in the Mojave, which if you know about it, um, is to absorb enormous amounts of groundwater buried under the desert and ship it presumably to Southern California for sale, whether this is a sustainable source of water. Well, every, every time we, come with a solution, you know, to recharge the aquifer is naturally more sustainable than, say, bringing desalination from the ocean. So uh, I don't know the specifics of this, you know, the project you're talking about, but uh, it's funny, it coincides with the name Cadiz, just the city in yep. south of Spain, yep. you know, where a lot of conquistadores took off from. Right. So, but, but yeah, equally so, Cadiz is a I can very send you city. some material. Yes, thank you for that. Sure, sure. of course. Sure. Uh, Tilly Hinton, who is a wonderful soul, uh, wonders what's the best practice in terms of increasing groundwater infiltration in a highly concretized landscape such as Los Angeles, San Diego, and places like that? Great. Well, remove the cement lining, but naturally we have to do it sustainably. And they're, you know, friends of the LA River and other people are involved. You should be involved if, if you have time. She is. And I'm, I'm happy she is, yeah. yeah so bring, bring the river back to how it looks, you know. We, we cannot invent cement-lined rivers ourselves, right. only because hydrologically or hydraulically they make sense, so. So the last question I'll ask, and, and Mark, I'm apologizing for not answering yours, um, follows up on a point that you made about recycled water. Uh, as Seth Pringle suggests, it seems inevitable that that's what we're going to do, and Orange County actually is doing a great deal of that. Um, are there examples of communities where recycled water is being reintroduced to water supplies? Absolutely. You know, I, I showed you the desalination discharge from the 
city of Ashkelon in the state of Israel, and I don't want to make them look bad, so kudos to them. Amazing recycling water consumers, and everybody is happy over there because of that. I mean, another example you just cited, the OCWD, you know, right. Orange County. So it's, it's possible, and uh, it has to be accepted by us. We accept a lot of things, and this is, right. this is not something that difficult. Right. Yeah, I, I will close with this thought that I spent a couple of days in Singapore several years ago, a close friend was living there and he took me to the plumbing system of the building in which basically the building is organic, and it just recycles its own water. Um, and that blew my mind. Um, well, thank you, Char. I, I really appreciate that you witnessed it, uh, you know, visibly. And if it's, if it can be done in Singapore, it can be done anywhere. Right. Yeah, you know, we are pioneers here. We we invent technologies, so let's right. let's use them too. Let's Good. Them Thank to you, Dr. Malouf, so Thank so you. much. This was really fabulous, and and I think sets us up very nicely for our next talk from um, Terry Red Owl, who um, knows a lot about water projects and the moving of water from the Eastern Sierra uh, to Los Angeles. Um, she is an enrolled member of the Bishop Paiute Tribe. She lives in Bishop with her husband and children. Um, and Terry has worked for the Owens Valley Indian Water Commission, a tribal consortium uh, that provides water, environmental, and agricultural services to its member tribes for the past 26 years. And for 22 of those 26, she's been uh, the executive director. Um, she, I, I thought I served on a lot of committees, but I am bowing in your direction. Uh, the list of corporations and committees and, and the like on which she serves, and I don't know how you do it, uh, but again, kudos to you for not only the Inyo County Water Commissioner and the Inyo LA Standing Committee and Manpower Consortiums for the California Indian Peoples, the US <laughs> EPA Region 9, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, but what's really interesting about the work of the commission that, that she's going to, I hope, to speak to is that she and it are in the forefront of negotiating tribal land and water for the Bishop. Pine, Big Pine and Lone Pine tribes and advocate for environmental protection and policy change. Um, and that means working with Los Angeles. And so we're so grateful for your presence here today uh, to help us understand for those who live in the city of Los Angeles, the impact of the LA aqueduct. Thank you, Terry, so much. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So Monahu, Inani and Terry Redall, and I want to thank Janine Finn and others that invited me to speak today. I'm um, excited to share our water history, our water story um, with you and talk about some of the, the environmental issues that we're facing as a result of water um, being exported out of our homelands down to the city of Los Angeles. I have a, a lot to share today, so I'm gonna talk really fast. Hopefully there'll be some time for Q&A at the end, but I'm gonna go ahead and um, share my screen now. Okay, so Paya Hinado, this is our water story. Paya Hinado is what we refer to as our, our homeland. And this is, um, it's interpreted as being the place where water has always flowed or the land of the, the flowing water. So today, like I mentioned, I'm gonna talk about our water history, our land history and our contemporary issues. So first, just a little background about the Water Commission. We were established in 1991 uh, and we're chartered under the Bishop Big Pine and Lone Pine tribes, our, which are our member tribes as well. We have six board of directors, two from each tribe that are either appointed or elected and really our, our primary um, task as a water commission is to be the planning and coordinating body for Indian water rights for our member tribes. We also provide other services such as agricultural, environmental, other water related services, environmental education. Um, we even serve tribes outside of our immediate geographic area and provide services throughout California, Arizona and Nevada. So this is where we're located. You can see um, the pink here. This is our homelands, our valley, Paihanadu. Here's a picture of, of the river um, flowing just below the mountains of Bishop, California. And we're located about 270 miles north of Los Angeles and about 200 miles south of Reno, Nevada, which would be somewhere up here on the map. And Paihanadu, 
uh, we are Paiute people. We call ourselves Numu. We're water people. We believe that we were put in this place, this location by the creator to take care of the water, to care for it, to respect it. It means life to us and to everything. And so now I wanna talk about our early uses of water. So prior to the arrival of settlers in our homelands, which began in about 1850s, we irrigated pretty much the whole valley, the whole area. Our, um, we had irrigation networks that were hand dug that were uh, 60 square or 60 miles of ditches. And in these networks, typically there would be a dam and a ditch per plotted land. And as you can see from here, this is just an example of a couple of areas that we were supplying water to, to irrigate our crops. And um, it came off of one of the main creeks that flows from the mountains in that previous picture that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. And these are the crops that we grew primarily. This is called taboos. It was a grass, and these are the little tubers that we would eat. And as you can see, these tubers are very small compared to the fingernail in this picture. So we had to have fields and fields and fields of our taboos in order to sustain ourselves and, and the people that depended on us. So each year, the Paiute people would elect somebody called a uh, Tuvaju, and this was our head irrigator. And so he would look at the land and decide where we were gonna spread the water that year. And they would dig these ditches and these um, waterways by hand. We didn't have backhoes, we didn't have shovels. We had what was called a pavada, which was a very long, eight foot long um, pole, hardwood pole that was about four inches in diameter. And so we would use that, all the men actually, and they would get together and they would dig these these areas to, to spread the water. And we would alternate the areas where we spread water that would allow um, areas to recover and to recede themselves. So we knew how to take care of the land. We knew how to respect the water and to move it to where we needed it. And then it would eventually flow back into its natural waterway and its system. In 1855, 1856, the surveyor that was hired um, to survey throughout the state of California came into our valley. And this is just one of the maps that he created. And he showed on these maps the areas that were being irrigated by the Indian people. And right here, he says, I found Indians in the fractional township who live deep in the mountain ravines. They come down here for grass to eat and also dig roots by them called sabus, which it's taboos actually. And that's a principal article of food. And he talks about the soil being first rate with fine grasses, mostly irrigated by the Paiute. So everywhere throughout the valley that he surveyed, he noted this, that they were being, these areas were being irrigated by the Paiutes. Here's a picture of a mapping that we did. So this is that main creek, the Bishop Creek that comes down from the mountains. And this is the town uh, of Bishop. And over here, we walked these areas and we GPS where these ditches used to be. And we um, looked at the satellite imagery and, and the mapping done by Von Smith and overlaid that when we created these maps. And so these areas here that are now dried were once probably like this, very green up here because they were being irrigated by our people. And then in 1859, there was this army captain that came in and, and did an expedition throughout the valley. And one of the things that's really noteworthy that I appreciate is he's, he says, it may be with truth said that these Indians have made some portions of their country which otherwise were desert to bloom and blossom as the rose. And that's just really precious to me. And it's something that I hold dear in my heart because I know I can only imagine what it took to make the land like that. And this is a picture of one of the, the ditches that was dug by hand. And you can see it's a very large, the, the width of it, not to mention the lake. And here's the town of Bishop way down here. And so, you know, we continued to do this for many, many years and till that changed when the, the settlers and the cattle ranchers moved into the valley, they began pushing us off the land and we were eventually forcibly marched by the United States Cavalry out of our land in 1863. That all started um, with the gold rush migration to California that started in 1848. And with the miners, 
came the, as I mentioned, the, the ranchers and the, the people that had cattle in order to supply food for these miners. One of the things that Captain Davidson also noted in his report was that um, he repeated to us that he had reason to believe that our country was set apart by the United States government, exempt from settlement, so long as we maintain peaceful and honest habits. And here is a picture of a, what we call a Tony. And so this is what our traditional houses would look like down on the valley floor. And um, however, that that didn't, that the United States plans for, for allowing us to remain in this valley really didn't happen because as more and more people came in, then we started having um, a period of time known as the Indian Wars. And here is an excerpt from this Colonel Warren Wasson, and he says that they've been, re and that's us, repeatedly told by officers of the government that they should have exclusive possession of the lands, and they're now fighting to obtain that possession. Because again, we were beginning to be pushed off of our areas and our way of life, our way to survive and take care of ourselves. And then they were considering um, relocating Indians from all over California over here to our homelands because it was such a remote area. However, they discarded that idea because extensive mines were discovered in the area and that the locality was impractical because of the mining now. And then in 1863, as I said earlier, over 900 of our people were first forcibly marched out of our valley down to Fort Tejon, which is north of Los Angeles, south of Bakersfield, California. There was a lot of people that were killed along the way. We have, um, um, extensive information on uh, massacres that took place down at the southern end of our valley at a lake area that we call Paciata. It's now known as the Owens Lake. It's actually the Owens Dry Lake because it's completely dry. It um, dried up in 10, within 10 years of Los Angeles diverting water, this 110 square mile navigable lake completely dried up. So after we were forcibly marched, eventually we came back to the valley or the ones that escaped were able to make their way back. And what we found is that the areas that we had been using were completely overrun by the, the farmers and the ranchers and, and they started growing their commercial crops, corn, wheat, alfalfa, et cetera. And so wh what did we do? We came back to the areas that were familiar to ourselves. We moved back to the sites we began to make um, homes in, in the areas that we once lived on and, and near and became day laborers or, or you know maybe even round the clock laborers to the settlement farms and ranches. And at that point in time, we really were a prime indispensable labor source um, for these ranches in the valley. And we actually developed a, a good relationship and sort of our new norm of existing in our homelands. And then that all changed once again. And why did it change? Well, Los Angeles and, and their agents came into the area and then our valley, Paya Hanadu, be historically became the, the watershed that has supplied Los Angeles for many, many years with the majority of its drinking water through the Los Angeles aqueduct. This is a, a map over here of that the aqueduct and, and where the water comes from. They take water as far north as the Mono Lake Basin up here. And, and then this is the, the area to the south of our valley that we call Paziata now dried up. And this is a picture of the irrigation, I mean the, the Los Angeles aqueduct in the southern part of our valley. So just going back to give a little history on the aqueduct in 1905 and 1906 Los Angeles city voters voted to approve uh, plans for the Los Angeles aqueduct and that included purchasing land and water rights. The aqueduct was um, constructed and completed in 1913 and Los Angeles began exporting water and they also um, began purchasing farms and ranches and these farmers and ranchers were willing to sell because they no longer had a guarantee of water. The water was being taken in these large pipes and through these water channels that were put in place in about seven years. The aqueduct is uh, 233 miles long. 
And by 1933, Los Angeles had purchased about 85% of the Valley's residential and commercial properties. They own 95% of the Valley's farm and ranch land. And then in 1941, they began exporting water from the Mono Basin. So this up here in brown is the Mono Basin. This is the Owens Valley Basin down here. And what this meant for us was a uh, decline in farming and ranching operations. And so we lost our, our employment. Many, many Paiute were, were no longer able to take care of themselves from, from working on the farming and ranch lands that they had um, assimilated to, if you will. The second Los Angeles aqueduct was completed in 1970. And the combined capacity between the two is 780 CFS uh, cubic feet per second or 570,000 acre feet of water per year. It's an extreme amount of water. A lot of people don't realize that there's actually two aqueducts leading um, from our valley down to Los Angeles. It's just referred to as the Los Angeles aqueduct. So here I, I wanna show um, in this graph that, and this is only goes to, to 1981 to present, but as you can see, all of the blue here is water that was supplied to the city of Los Angeles from the Los Angeles aqueduct, from Payahinado, our homelands. And then the darker green is, is water from the Metropolitan Water District. And then the yellow is local, locally sourced groundwater. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased to see, and I wanna see this, this pink part of the, the grass in, increase, and that's um, recycled water that started in the early 2000s. Now, sometimes there's a dip in the amount of water that we've supplied Los Angeles, and that's when we've had severe drought. And what we're seeing, the trend with the drought and the climate change is, you know, there's less and less water available in the Sierras as snowpack and runoff, and that means there's gonna be less water available, um, surface water available for Los Angeles to take. And um, as I mentioned, this particular graph only goes back to 1981, but I know that looking at other charts and, and, and graphs that these figures were even higher earlier than the 1980s. And this has resulted in all kinds of, of environmental issues that we deal with, a lot of dust problems, um, dead trees, tumbleweeds, uh, you know, change of our landscape really from what we were used to. Here's a picture of Paziata. This is um, a dust storm that was happening and this is one of my coworkers that went out to look at some of the mitigation projects that DWP was um, ordered to do on that lake. At one point in time, the lake was the largest source of PM10 and PM 2.5 dust pollution in the United States, those particles are so, so small. And once you get them in your lungs, it's you really cannot get it out. And as a result of that, we have a lot of people in our homelands that suffer from respiratory illnesses. And now I'm gonna shift a little bit and talk more about the land and um, how we ended up where we are today. So, the tribes, the indigenous people in Paihanado, known as the Eastern Sierra region, have extremely small reservations compared to our historic territories. Um, and how come? Why? Well, really, the reason why we're on these small reservations, it's all was done to facilitate getting water to Los Angeles. And I just want to point out that this picture over here with the indigenous person with the, the basket, um, in the, the aqueduct flowing to Los Angeles. This was done by a um, project um, called the Aqueduct Between Us and um, by a, a Tongva descendant. Her name is Annie Mendoza. And I would suggest looking that project up on Instagram. It's a really interesting um, information. It parallels how we are connected, our uh, Payahinado with the Tongva's homelands down in Los Angeles. And so this is kind of a map showing what our traditional lands were. Actually, some of our historic historians and historic preservation officers say our homelands even extended over into the Yosemite area, Yosemite Valley. But today, this is what we live on. Tiny, tiny reservations. These are exaggerated so that you can see the dots on the map. 
the reservations in our valley combined only total just over 1700 acres of land and the valley floor the owens valley that's about 460,000 acres of land and so of that the tribes only um, have like i said over 1700 acres of land and it's really hard for our our people with the the populations that we have to be able to survive on that land base but it wasn't always like that um, in 1912, President Taft had set aside a reservation of 2,800 acres, and these were scattered parcels, along with an additional 67,000 acre tract of land. This is the 67,000 acres of land that was set aside, and the Indian Service was supposed to figure out how to get water to these tablelands, um, because there's no um, streams that really flow through there, except you know a few areas down here. And so that was their job to figure out how can we get water from these different lakes and reservoirs up here over to this area, but they didn't do it. They didn't do their job. And in 1932, LA came out with this report saying that those lands were non-operative wastelands and they should be removed from trust status and made public domain. And really the reason why they wanted to do that is they wanted to secure those lands as watershed protection for the city of Los Angeles. So, in 1932, two days after getting, um, af after the Secretary of Interior wrote to President Hoover, he removed those lands from trust status. And so they, we were never able to turn those lands into reservation lands. During that time period also, starting in the 1890s, uh, um, across the United States and here in the Valley as well, Indians began applying for what was called allotments. These were lands that they could eventually privately own. And here's a picture of a, an allotment that was along a creek, uh, the Pine Creek above Bishop, California. However, LA wanted to tie up and, and gain control of those lands. A lot of those lands, those allotment lands came with water. They were long creeks, they had riparian water rights. And so they came in and when they were buying up a private land, they also started buying up those allotments that some of the Indians owned. And this, um, by 1933, they had purchased 4,400 acres of land, many of those lands with water rights, which today is three times the amount of land that, that the tribes have. And when they purchased those allotments, they often paid half or maybe a quarter of what they were paying the non-Indian landowners. In 1930, LA came out with this report and it was called the Indian problem because now they had taken away lands that had been set aside. They had been instrumental in having them removed from trust. We had been pushed off of the lands that we had been using. We were no longer able to work for the farmers and ranchers that we once worked for. And we were living wherever we could live. And so they came out with this report saying we were homeless Indians, we were scattered, we were squatting, we were making waste of water. And they came up with a couple of solutions and it was to either relocate us or remove us from the valley. And here is just some excerpts from that report. They're saying we're camping in or squatting in widely scattered places along streams, making waste of the water, using immense quantities of the waters. But we were doing what we knew how to do, you know, what we were always um, that known for, and that was being by water and taking care of water. So they said that we would benefit by being grouped together. And the benefit would be they would have better control over the indigenous population. And the question of land acquirement and title would be defined or fixed and questionably. So Los Angeles came up with this plan. They even um, had drawings of what these small centralized location reservations would look like. And they were near the towns of Bishop, Big Pine and Lone Pine. However, their plans didn't call for any consideration of the future growth of the indigenous people. So based on that report and, and advocating for being able to centralize us and control us, the United States government and the city of Los Angeles entered into this land exchange because the United States had prior to that purchase, went out and purchased private lands um, that were scattered here and there for the use of the indigenous people and they were having to supply water to those areas. 
And in some cases, it took a lot of water. You'd have to push a lot of water to get it to the place of use. And LA didn't like that because that was wasting water. So that in 1937, um, Congress authorized this land exchange. It was pushed by the United States government and their reasoning, they were saying that the lands that the United States owned, which was about 3000 acres of land in exchange for what we would receive was fully as valuable as the 1,400-ish acres of land that the, the Indian people would eventually receive if this land exchange went through. And so, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> it did go through and it went through very quickly. So it was introduced, this bill on uh, March 3rd and it passed on March 10th. We didn't have a voice in what happened. We didn't have a say and there's record, we have historical records of those hearings and in it they're saying there's Indians here from California who desire to be heard on this bill. And the speaker's saying it's too late now, of course. And he's saying, well, they, it occurs to me that the Indians have no voice in this matter. We're going mighty fast to bring up the passage on the 10th of March, a bill that was introduced on the 3rd of March. It's the speediest action I've seen on legislation in this house. Well, it ended up passing and without um, a proper hearing and without you know, hearing our input. And this is the result of that land exchange. So you can see the, the orange squares are what the United States gave up, almost 3,000 acres of land for just under 1,400 acres of land for the Bishop, Big Pine, and Lone Pine Indian reservations. Now, um, in that land exchange, in the act of Congress, it said that the water rights were to be exchanged as well. However, after that was passed, Los Angeles announced that their city charter prohibits the exchange or sale of water rights without a two thirds vote of their, their voting um, residents. And so the parties decided, and this is the United States government and the city of Los Angeles, that each party would retain its water rights to those lands that were traded and that Los Angeles would deliver water um, th that's based on shares in these canal companies that the United States owned to the boundaries of the reservations. And when that happened, essentially the United States gave up almost 11,000 acre feet of water in exchange for the delivery of just over 5,500 acre feet of water. We also um, lost the riparian water rights. We no longer, you know, we don't have those riparian rights today, nor do we have the groundwater rights under our existing reservations or the groundwater rights that were um, tied to the lands that the United States traded. Now, if you take in the allotted lands that Los Angeles purchased, plus the 3,000 acres of land that they got, this is what that graph looks like now. So about over, over 7,000 acres in exchange for just under 1,400 acres, not to mention the his, our historical territories or the other lands that were set aside and later taken out of trust. In the 1990s, the tribes began negotiating our water rights with the city of Los Angeles and with assistance from the United States government Department of Interior. However, those negotiations were unsuccessful. They um, lacked water, access to wet water actually, it would essentially have been a paper water right had we agreed to this. And the amount of water that was being proposed was insufficient even to meet our needs today, let alone our needs in the future. There was no additional lands um, considered in those negotiations, no funding for infrastructure, no compensation for loss of water, um, no guarantee um, of access to our cultural sites and so on and so forth. So there was a lot of problems with that. And since that time, because we didn't accept that that settlement, the government really has stepped back from being our trustee and from helping us. And you know what their excuse is, is that you know we're in the self-determination era as far as Indian policy goes. So it's up to, to the tribes to figure it out. And um, the United States government really was instrumental in, in making this happen with Los Angeles and they have not accepted their responsibility. And what we're working for right now is reserved Indian water rights to meet our present day and our future needs of the people for agriculture, domestic purposes, cultural, uh, environmental protection, uh, ecological values, so on and so forth. 
We're also looking at how can we assert our Aboriginal title under state water law using the, the information that we have about um, the, the waterways that we were, we were using before people came into the valley when we were forcibly removed. And there's a lot of challenges to that. Um, one of the requirements is uninterrupted use of that water under state law and occupation of those lands which we don't have and we haven't had, but we're not giving up on that. We're continuing with that. And so not only are we seeking the return of land and water, we're also fighting to save our homelands. Up here in our valley, LADWP has really poor water management practices. They're unwilling to meet their obligations in a long-term groundwater agreement between the Los Angeles, city of Los Angeles and Inyo County. Um, they're, their water management has led to extensive environmental damage throughout our valley. Again, here's you know those pictures that I shared earlier. Lots of dead vegetation and trees and tumbleweeds and um, habitat for our precious animals that we have to speak for that have been destroyed and health problems. So some of the contemporary issues are, I feel like, and we all feel like up here that Los Angeles has the over-reliance on water imported from Paya Hinata with no plans for reduction. And um, with the climate change and the droughts that we're experiencing, this makes it even more difficult when they're still looking at our homelands as being one of their major water suppliers. There's extensive groundwater pumping in our valley that continues to this day. And the actions that LA is taking is really moving towards ramping up that groundwater pumping instead of ramping it down. And you know, with less surface water available, where do they get water from? The ground. And it's causing all kinds of problems. And you know, we're, we're really opposed to the amount of groundwater pumping that has been taking place, let alone any uh, additional groundwater pumping. There's incomplete mitigation projects or projects that they consider complete that aren't meeting their goals. There's restrictions on accessing cultural sites. Sometimes we can't get into the areas that are important to us. And LA ha still has an unwillingness to return lands to the tribes. And their unwillingness to consider water saving alternatives up here in Paihinatu. I applaud them for you know, some of the work they're doing and, and trying to um, clean up the groundwater aquifer and you know, slowly moving towards rain, rainwater capture and stormwater um, projects and stuff. But it, there could be a lot more that could be done. In uh, LA's Green New Deal, their sustainability plan that came out in 2019, one of their goals was by 2025 was to reduce LADWP purchases of imported water by 50%. And I wanna emphasize purchases because instead of them saying, we want to reduce imported water by 50%, they're just saying purchase water. So they're not, they don't consider our water from Paya Hinado to be imported water because they don't have to purchase it. In their urban water management plan that's out right now, it's a draft plan. Um, it states in their plan that the total amount of water exported from the Eastern Sierra will remain consistent with historical exports. Even though you know, they're looking at increasing their local water supply, they're not looking at decreasing the amount of water that they take from our homelands. And I wanna point out that this draft report, it's 274 pages. It was put together without any consultation with the tribes. Los Angeles is getting ready to have public hearings, but they still have not consulted with the tribes on this plan or taken you know, our needs into consideration. And here is a map again, just showing how water is supplied to Los Angeles and the areas, the state water project, the Colorado River, those are the imports that they're looking at reducing, but not the Los Angeles aqueduct. Now, um, another area that I just wanna briefly touch on is one of our contemporary issues, and I had mentioned it earlier, is groundwater pumping. In Big Pine, the way that our valleys um, set up is Los Angeles considers certain areas to be well filled. And so we have an area down where the Big Pine Reservation is and it's called the Big Pine Well Field. Well, this is the heaviest pumped well field in the entire valley. And supposedly it's pumped, the reason why it's pumped that much is to supply water to a fish hatchery that's nearby. The average pumping in this well field over the past 20 years 
has been 22,685 acre feet of water per year. This has resulted in extensive water table decline. The average depth of water in Big Pine is 80 feet below the surface, which is causing in incredible amounts of damage to the area. And Bishop, where I live, which is just about 15 miles away from Big Pine, you know, our depth of water is about eight, 10 feet, sometimes even higher in, in certain areas. And this is a picture of a tree that died on the Big Pine Reservation and that fell over just um, last week on February 24th when a windstorm came through. So these are the kind of issues, you can see how dry from this picture the reservation land is, it's not green at all. And that's because the water table from the, the pumping that happens in Big Pine. Now, some of the solutions to this, and here's a picture of, of one of the pumps, the, the groundwater wells and the pumps that supplies water to that fish hatchery is, is you know, we believe that there could be, a, one of the solutions would be instead of pumping so much water that is pumped, then only supply water to the fish hatchery when it needs it and, and how much it needs. So try, we're trying to figure out how much water does the fish hatchery actually need and when does it need it, mostly during spawning season. LA, it's my understanding, was asked to install these variable frequency drive pumps in their wells, which would allow them to ramp down the pumping instead of either, either having the well on or off. And when it's on, it's pumping that full capacity, and I believe it's a 36 inch pipe just in one of the wells, and there's two wells out there. Um, but Los Angeles refused to do that. So if they would put that in, they could ramp down the pumping and only supply water in the amounts needed when it's needed. And also there needs to be updated infrastructure out there at that fish hatchery, which would allow for improvements in, in aeration and be able to possibly do water recycling and then um, spread water in that area to recharge springs. The fish hatchery, it's called Fish Springs Fish Hatchery because it actually used to be supplied by a spring that was dried up when Los Angeles started pumping groundwater from the area. And um, what, you know, I just touched on a few of the environmental and um, contemporary issues that we have related to water, but, you know, we're continuing to press forward. You know, we don't give up because it's our homeland that we have to protect and our future, our kids. And our goals that we're working towards is acquiring enough land and enough water to meet our current and our future needs of our people and to take care of our environment. Right now, uh, more and more you guys are, are seeing this, especially with COVID, that you know, there's these movements to source your food locally, to grow and produce locally. And that's what we wanna do, but we need the land and we need the water to be able to do that. We want to move towards traditional food re revitalization. We want to be able to um, increase our traditional crops, our beans, our squash, and other things that, that we're, we're known for. And then also, you know, in, in the capitalist world that we live in, be able to have other crops and, and other things that can help um, generate revenue to take care of our people. We want to have improved access um, to water, irrigation water on our reservation. This is Big Pine, um, they were fortunate that day to be able to get water, irrigation water. And as you can see, it's planting some new fruit trees that were put in there in a way, in an effort to be able to supply food to this household, which if we could all do that, we would have healthier lifestyles, improved economic stability while reducing our carbon footprint. We also want to have access to our cultural and ceremonial sites with co-management. Here's um, Hughes Hot Springs and <clears throat> here's a posted no trespassing, keep out. A lot of times they fence these areas off and it makes it really difficult for us to get in there. So we wanna be able to have um, co-management or management or um, conservation easements of those lands where you know we can manage those lands ourselves. We wanna have room and land so that we could have housing for our people and economic development. And this is why we do what we do. This is out at Q's Hot Springs, or an area that's um, a, a place of healing for us.
Okay, so now you might be wondering, well, what can I do? How can I help? Really, um, one of the, the big things you can do is support innovative water management systems that recycle water, um, be mindful of wasteful water practices, invest in technologies that enhances the efficient use of water, maximizes rain recapture, um, cleaning up Los Angeles groundwater basin, get informed of what the issues are, attend meetings, um, especially now it's a lot easier for some people that can't travel to the meetings to be able to attend these meetings virtually, and then advocate for the things that are important to you that you feel are, are worth your time Voice your support for um, reductions in water exportation from Paihanaru, from our homelands, and the return of Los Angeles' owned lands to the tribes. Contact your elected officials, your city council members, the mayor, the LADWP Board of Commissioners, supporting tribal interests and environmental protection. Be our ally. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we have a story map, which gives a really good overview of our history as well, and share our story. You know, when you get involved and you get on our um, contact list, we'll keep you updated of, of what's going on in the Valley. And if you have skills or, or money or know people that can donate their time to help us, that's always welcomed. Manahovu, which means thank you in our Paiute language, and I'll now open it up if there's time for any questions that you might have. Thank you so, so, so much, Terry. Um, <laughs> you actually have answered all of the questions at one level in your oh. last couple of slides, which was brilliant. Um, but there are some that are intriguing, and let me, let me pass them along to you. Linda Shea wonders whether the new California Water Hedge Fund will impact um your area and your lives okay so i don't know enough about that to comment on it um but anytime um water is monetized i believe that rural communities and um uh tribal communities are the ones that always end up paying the price yeah that makes we have a long history of that um, in, in many ways. Uh, Tilly Hinton um, wonders if Los Angeles did in fact become water independent. Um, what would the transition be like? What would be the transformation environmentally um, for Paiunaru? Yes, that's a good question. Thank you. So, you know, our water, as I mentioned earlier, it flowed down to the south end of the valley called into a, a lake called Paciata. And so water would once again be able to flow in these natural channels. It would um, be taken out of the aqueduct. I believe that we would see a resurgence of plant and animal life. We would be able to um, once again um, have subsistence in our, our foods that we once were able to use. And, I, and that lake would, would eventually fill up again. It would take a long time because water hasn't been in there for so, so long. But it would be wonderful to see that, you know, that was the, a major area for migrating birds. And we still see a lot of migrating birds out there making use of that lake. And our people used to collect brine flies by the bushels and we ate those. And that was our protein. That's how we survived. And, and we would see that again. And in 2017, when we had that record runoff year and, and snow melt across the state of California and, and actually in the West, there was a lot of water available in the valley so much that um, the Los Angeles aqueduct didn't have the capacity to export it all. And so a, a lot of us wanted to see that water flow down into the lake again, which LA refused to let that happen because they said it would destroy their dust mitigation um, projects out there, infrastructure and everything. And so what they did is they took that water and they spread that water. And when they, the areas that they spread the water, which we are really appreciative of, we have groundwater monitoring wells throughout the valley. We've seen those water tables come up. And in other years when LA was sued and they had to spread water, those water tables, particularly near Big Pine that I mentioned earlier, came up and they stayed up for several years before they started to decline. So I think we would see what I would consider in my mind and I can visualize a paradise landscape. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, Harold Eaton wonders what um, the Bishop Paiute people and, and other tribes might want to ask of Secretary 
Holland, assuming she gets confirmed, are, are there sort of immediate issues, immediate asks? Yes, there are. And what we would really like is to see her examine the Department of Interior's Indian water rights policy and the way that they prioritize and manage and handle Indian water rights across the country. Because we, like I said, when we didn't accept the settlement that the United States government felt was in our best interest, they washed their hands of us and we became, they have never helped us since then. And still to this day, there's some staff people that remember that and they won't help us because of that. And it, you know, and that needs to be re-examined for sure. Great, thank you. Um, how can we amplify your concerns? I think you've answered it, but if you wanna reinforce that, um, in terms of the city of Los Angeles and more broadly as communities that pull water from lots of places and thus lots of ancestral territorial and unceded territory. Yes, so like I said, getting involved, speaking out, writing letters, contacting people that you know and asking them to speak out as well. Last year, DWP had proposed to pump in their, their annual pumping plan that they come out every year. It was the most water that they proposed to pump in like 60 years, or maybe it was 30. <laughs> I take that back. Either and way. so we, we got a hold of us and some of our other allies and some of the, the local environmental, tribal environmental offices reached out to our contacts. And at the meeting that Los Angeles was presenting their pumping plan, we had over 108 people come and speak and say, it is not okay, LA, for you to take that water, as much water as you're planning on taking, and you need to consult with the tribe, and you need to give land back to the tribes, you know, and they heard that, and I recently learned that Mitch O'Farrell, uh, Council Member Mitch O'Farrell from Los Angeles is now on the Inyo LA Standing Committee, which we're really pleased about that, and so I think that's a good opportunity to get a hold of him and tell him what your concerns are. Great, that's fantastic. Uh, my colleague Mark Los Huertos wonders of the many state and local and national land management agencies, which seem to be, if any, more pliable in terms of uh, restorative potential. Hmm. The pause speaks volumes. <laughs> um, so right now, you know, we're we're trying to work with California Fish and Wildlife right. on the Fish Springs fish hatchery issue, and so you can reach out to them and say, hey you know, we, how can we support you? Because what I was told when the tribe had a meeting with them is they have such a small budget that when they need nails, they're out there hammering them and straightening them out. They only have money for, for fish food is for what I understand. So figuring out ways where we can um, improve their technologies out there and having them tell us how much water do you need and when do you need it? So we can go back to Los Angeles and say, you know what, put in those, the right, pump so we can ramp down that pumping. That's brilliant. And actually that leads to our final question, which is what relationship the commission might have, you have uh, with settlers in the region, uh, particularly ranchers. Um, it's clear that you're seeking collaborations and allyship. And I wondered if you could sort of end us on that note. Yeah, so, you know, we're always looking at having good relationships with everybody especially our, our neighbors, you know, the people that, that live here in the Valley and, and face a lot of times the same issues that we do. And I would say, um, you know, we have collaborated with the ranchers, especially on the Keep Long Valley Green issues that came up when Los Angeles was re, um, trying to reduce, completely reduce irrigation water in those areas. And it affected um, the, the habitat, but also ranch leases and, and cattle operations. And so, you know, we, we worked with them to help them and um, as I mentioned, you know, early on in our history, we initially didn't have a good relationship, but then we developed a, a good working medium with them. And actually when the United States was considering relocating us in the 1930s and, and before that, when LA came out with their Indian problem report, a lot of those ranchers advocated that we needed to stay because we were a labor force that helped make their operations successful. And so we wanna, work on actually strengthening those partnerships and being able to work with them to train our youth in agricultural sciences. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you so, so much, Terry Red Owl, uh, for this brilliant presentation. Um, and I, you know, I think you have helped us see issues that we may have known, but have not felt as deeply as you have. And I really appreciate your contributions today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.
Uh, now going to shift focus, um, but not really. It turns out that one of the projects that is also going on in the library uh, called the Bending Water Project that has to do with how can we begin to think out and, and seek out as one questioner asked earlier, um, sources of indigenous presence in this archive. Um, and leading us through this discussion, again, our two wonderful colleagues from the library, Janine Finn and uh, Catalina Lopez. Uh, Dr. Finn is a project lead for the Bending Waters Project and, and also for the Data Science and Digital Scholarship. She is also the Data Science and Digital Scholarship Coordinator at the library, where many of us get to work with her. Um, she, her work is to, includes extensive outreach across the seven campuses of the consortium, offering support for data management, collaborating on a data intensive student and faculty research, and serving as a key point of contact for the library's expanding uh, resources in data science, as well as digital scholarship. Uh, Catalina Lopez is the project manager for the Bending Water Project, and they're gonna tell us a great deal more about this. Um, she began as a student assistant, um, and digitized materials in the California Water Documents Collection, um, became the project manager a year ago. So a belated welcome in a sense. Um, and she's been a reference librarian at Chapman University and has worked in university libraries for the last eight years. But the work that they're going to lay out for us really grew out of our sort of curiosity about what actually this water resource um, has at its disposal and particularly surfacing indigenous people's voices um, and concerns that are therein often silenced. So Catalina and Janine, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna invite Catalina to share her screen. She's gonna be our slide driver. Um, thank you all for being here in this virtual space together to talk about water. It's just been amazing to me. Um, I will confess I'm a fairly new Californian and I'm fairly new to this water history space, but um, between working with this project and getting to know Char and getting to know all of the people in this place, you've sucked me in. I'm, I'm doing water history forever, uh, so thank you. Uh, my name is Janine Finn and I'm a data science and digital scholarship librarian here at the Claremont College's library and I'll be presenting with my colleague Catalina Lopez about the Bending Water Project here at the Claremont College's. Uh, next slide please. As my colleague Lisa outlined uh, in the first part of it this, this morning, the Western Water Archives are just a huge wide ranging collection of primary sources about water history in California and the West covering over two centuries. It's complicated to handle uh, literally practically and it's also really, really rich in data sources and primary sources for understanding some of the Western water issues. So building on the success of this uh, clear water grant that the Special Collections uh, Unit drove, in 2019, a team from Claremont, including uh, Char Miller from Pomona as our faculty PI, we applied for a grant from the Mellon Foundation Collections as Data Project to build on this work and to make these water archives more discoverable, more accessible, more representative of some of the current issues in water. Uh, we were awarded one of these grants, uh, one of the seven grantees for this project in January 2020, just a couple months before uh, the world shut down pretty much. Um, so next slide. Uh, just to, to backtrack, we, collections as data is the project we're doing, and that's sort of a strange phrase, uh, just to explain it a little bit. Um, it's a project currently funded by the Mellon Foundation. It was originally an IMLS, Institute of Museum and Library Studies project. Um, they, uh, a group of PIs at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, were awarded $750,000 to regrant to seven smaller teams uh, to do some, some exploratory material uh, projects. Processing. And the goal of this grant is to take heritage materials that have already been digitized, like our California water history materials, and make them more accessible to computational methods, as well as surface histories of groups and individuals that have been marginalized by previous archival approaches. This grant project is unique and was really appealing to us and that part of the deliverables for the grant are not just a data set, right, but also the workflows, the processes we went through uh, to sort of do the kind of engagement and assessment necessary to make a really useful collection. Um, which is wonderful, but also, as we all know, in a COVID world, outreach, engagement, meeting with people, having these conversations are 
sometimes really more complicated, um, but also more accessible because here we are all in Zoom from all kinds of different places. Uh, next slide, please. There's a really rich diversity of materials in this collection, as Lisa has highlighted and has have others have spoken to. Uh, many different types of provenances and just a huge number of items. Um, of the many thousands that were digitized under the Clear Water Grant, we've decided to focus on, with our little grant project, approximately 1,100 items within this collection that were identified as data set by the previous processing. This includes primarily tables, as you can see in the bottom left, but also a few charts, some amazing hand-drawn charts, maps. So um, like looking at the items on this slide, we are starting with the graphs and tables like you see on the right and on the bottom. Um, other materials like big long narratives, there's lots of rich description, you know, observational material, there are photographs. These could all benefit as well from some of the, the processing that we're doing, but we're sort of starting with a small grant, a small timeline, looking at some of these uh, low hanging fruit pieces like these tables and charts. Uh, next slide. So to sort of divide the work into two baskets, um, the short version is that we are number one improving computational accessibility of these materials. That means sort of taking these scanned images of tables and turning them into tabular data. These in the collection are mostly observational reports related to things like dam discharge, stream flows, other observations about surface water and groundwater that were relegate to, relevant to the irrigation and water projects going on in this area. Uh, we're trying to make these images of data sets actually tabular data, which will wind up being CSV files with appropriate metadata, so they're more accessible to researchers using computational methods to look at longitudinal assessments of, of data. We're also looking at, I think there's one more click, Catalina, looking at adding, uh, yes, location information, latitude, longitude, adding GIS information, including uh, shape files and things. So these maps can be read into GIS systems for more analysis. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the second area of work is surfacing the stories of native communities in California whose water resources, as we just heard, were decimated by settlers and industrialists in this part of the country in this part of the country and those native communities are absent in many cases in these archives uh, these are peoples and communities whose histories remain largely hidden in our current archival arrangements our archives were inherited from white industrialists and municipal water districts who worked to promote the interest of settlers and land developers for the most part at the expense of native people uh, next slide so how do we bring native communities and voices into conversation with these archives? Honestly, we are doing a lot of listening. We are meeting with our native neighbors, including the Tongva here in uh, the Los Angeles area, the Owens Valley group up in uh, Owens Valley. Many of the Eastern nations were reaching out to the Pachanga, Cahuilla, among others out in the sort of Eastern more desert area to get a better understanding of what their current projects are, what their concerns are, what they've been doing. Terry and the Owens Valley Group have been in this area for decades. This is a generations long uh, project. So we are doing a lot of listening and we need to hear what their interests and concerns are as we sort of develop this collection in a way that can be in conversation with them. Uh, which all goes to say that we have no one size template for this, right? Uh, there are the way that native peoples have used water in this part of the country is diverse. It is diverse as the landscape here is in the West. Um, so it's just doing a lot of listening. We are looking at do, uh, adding native place names. Our collection is all, you know, settler language, GIS, very much Western ways of thinking of land. We're trying to integrate uh, different uh, languages into those metadata. Um, we're also including maps. We have uh, sort of reached out to our Native community members who are making maps, making story maps to sort of elevate their stories in the way they've, they've talked about land. So it's ongoing. It is iterative. We are just trying to uh, start these conversations and, and support our community members who are doing different kinds of water work. Uh, next slide, please. So what is our work um, on this grant? As I mentioned earlier, part of the deliverables from this grant is to document our processes along the way. So it's not just delivery of a data set, but it's sharing the methods and sharing what we did, sharing our successes and sharing our mistakes. 
Um, one big piece of the current work is our outre outreach and engagement. Um, despite, despite all the pandemic challenges, we've been able to have productive conversations and focus groups with researchers working in water, researchers working in indigenous history. We've had conversations with librarians and archivists. As Lisa mentioned this morning, sometimes there are you know, uh, systemic and organizational challenges. You can't get to the archive you want when you want it, when you want to do your grant project because stuff's going on. Uh, so we're trying to sort of have these conversations so we get a sense of where people's needs are, where people's interests are, um, and make sure that we pay attention to the data that is most useful. In talking to researchers, we want to find out what's what's missing in your current research. Are you missing groundwater assessments? Are you missing observations from early settlers? What What is useful to you in some of these conversations? Uh, next slide, please. The other big piece is learning the technical steps. Uh, there is a lot of uh, previous work on using optical character recognition, OCR for archival materials, turning you know, images into text and numbers and data, uh, but there aren't super well, yeah, super well established standards for turning some of that material into data sets in a consistent way. How do we record dates and numbers and measurements? And every discipline is a little bit different. So we're sort of being cautious in how we do this, this transfer of data. There's a lot of uh, error checking. There's a lot of uh, quality control. There's a lot of sort of conversation that needs to happen. Um, but we're working on some prototypes. We've got some pilots going and Catalina will be explaining that in a little more detail. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, before I hand things off, I'd like to quickly introduce the whole group that's working on this project. Um, part of the object and the reason we were so pleased about this grant was it was that it involved a team from across the library, across the colleges, doing work that they have expertise in and trying to find a way to do it in a sustainable way. So once this grant is over, all of us working from across the library uh, we'll have some experience on this kind of pilot and can bring our skills to bear in future projects. Um, it includes myself, uh, Jessica Davila, who's our Director of Digital Scholarship, Yacy from our unit, as well as uh, Elizabeth from Catalog, and Lisa, who you've already met, uh, Mark Buckholz and Kenneth up in our unit as well, Char Miller from Environmental Analysis, and Warren Roberts, who many of you may know, who's our GIS guru. Um, he hasn't helped us a whole lot yet, but we will be dragging him in shortly to do a lot more GIS uh, mapping and maybe some drones and cool stuff like that. Um, I am pleased to introduce Catalina, who will take over, and she is our amazing project manager for this project, and she's going to go into a little more detail uh, about some of the technical work we're doing and also uh, ask for your help with a survey project. Thanks. Thanks, Janine. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Catalina, and I am the project manager for the Bending Water Project. I'm going to show some examples of how we are working on the computational conversion of the materials in the California Water Documents Collection, uh, primarily the materials containing uh, water data, as Janine had uh, shared earlier. Um, like she said, the goal is to make the data accessible. Um, we're looking into making it into CSV formats uh, where scholars can use uh, these um, files in their data analysis. So first, we need to know what kinds of data was in the California Water Documents Collection. Uh, we extracted the metadata records for the collection um, from the metadata storage application content DM. Uh, we determined currently there are 13,746 objects, and that includes you know, um, photographs, uh, letters, documents, um, so pretty much the whole collection. Um, we then narrowed down the records in that uh, list that contained the term data sets in its metadata. This term was created from the CLEAR project when they created the metadata records for these objects. And once we narrowed it down, we found that there were over 1,100 objects that contain data sets and specifically charts, maps, and or tables. Uh, Kenneth Kotick, who is our data review specialist for the project, uh, actually went through all of the 1,100 objects uh, to assess what kinds of charts, maps, and our tables are in the collection. Um, here is a screenshot of part of the list of the metadata records. And as you can see at the top where it says the type field in the top left, um, if you look through that list, you can see where the term data set is in that list. So the, this is the list of all the items that um, you know, had the term data set inside. Um, this is 
a small portion of the 1100 uh, records that are on this Excel sheet. Uh, now that we knew which objects in the collection had data sets, um, it was time to work on the OCR process. Uh, OCR stands for Optical Character Recognition, uh, which means um, the electronic or mechanical conversion of images of typed, handwritten, or printed text into machine encoded text. And the OCR application that we decided to use for this project is Abby Fine Reader. Now, as you can see here, here's a screenshot of one of the tables that is in the collection. Um, it's a summary of irrigated crops from 1941. Um, I extracted the PDF from the uh, entire object. And this is going to be the first example I'm going to show of how we imported this into Abby Fine Reader. So here's what it looks like when you open up Abby Fine Reader. As you can see on the left, um, that is the original PDF with the table. And Abby Fine Reader recognized that the text at the top is just plain text, uh, the summary of irrigated crops 1941. And you can see that imported into the right side. Um, it also recognized the table format of the PDF. And you can see on the right side, it's uh, formatted it as close as possible. Uh, now you can see that there are some light blue highlights in the, um, the, the version that Abby Fine Reader is trying to convert. And these are called low confidence characters. Um, basically, Abby Fine Reader just wants the user to verify that they converted it correctly. And I'm going to show you an example. So as you can see, um, there's a little small, it, basically it'll pop up the um, areas where there are low confidence characters. As you can see, there's the word berries, and it converted it into with a T. Um, so what you can do is manually just fix the text yourself, and it will um, implement that in Abby Fine Reader. Uh, you can see at the bottom, here's another example in this particular table. Um, there's a number 337,926. Um, it didn't really recognize it that well, um, but again, I can go ahead and edit it myself. Um, using the keyboard. Um, as you can see here, once we go through all of the different lights, uh, the highlighted areas, um, the document's ready to be exported. And this is where we want to eventually put them into CSV files. Um, so I'm going to show an example of how we can extract it. And here it is. Uh, we have, we're using it in, we're using Excel for right now to look at the CSV files. But as you can see, it gets a pretty clear, um, clean version of PDF. And this is where the next step would be to eventually put it into some data repository, such as a uh, Dryad or Zenodo, uh, where scholars can eventually, um, you know, use the CSV files in their research. Here's another example of a table. Um, this is the discharge of Malkalumne River at Woodbridge. And I just want to acknowledge that this location of the Makalune River was originally inhabited by the Yokuts, Miwok, and Winton Native American people. Uh, apologies for if I uh, mispronounced anything. Um, but as you can see here, this particular table is found within the State of California Department of Public Works. And this is the report of Sacramento San Joaquin water supervision for 1937. So this is just one of the many tables that are in this particular booklet. Here's what it looks like again in Abby Fine Reader. You can see on the left, it recognized the text areas of the table, and it also recognized the table itself. And you can see here on the right that there is a lot more low confidence characters that just need to be corrected. Uh, once you do that process again, where you go through each of the different highlight areas, um, this is what it looks like uh, when it's put it in Excel, um, particularly, uh, preferably a CSV file. And you can see how it's pretty clear, uh, clean cut tables. Um, now, there are challenges when using Abby Fine Reader. Uh, we noticed that this OCR process was not compatible with any of the charts or maps that we have in the collection. Um, another challenge is that some of the tables contain multiple headers. Um, and we discovered that um, if we we're gonna be using CSV files as a way to export these tables, um, uh, we determined that having multiple headers was not going to be compatible. 
Um, I'm going to show you examples of both of these challenges. Um, you can see here on the left, here's a chart um, from the collection. And I put it in Abby Freinader, but as you can see, it's actually highlighted in red versus if you saw earlier, um, the tables were highlighted in blue. Um, when something is highlighted in red in Abby Freinader, that basically means that it, it can only recognize it as a pure image. And we, we don't really want another image to be imported in Excel. So we would have to look at other outlets in terms of uh, converting the, the charts into some other type of computational data. Um, here's another example. If we were to add a map inside of Abby Freinader, again, it only recognizes it as an image. As you can see on the right, there is no type of uh, type of transcription or conversion through Abby Fine Reader. Um, this is the second challenge that I had mentioned: how there's multiple headers um, in some of the tables in the collection. As you can see here, uh, we have where it says height in feet, capacity in acre feet, volume in a thousand cubic yards. But then below it, you can see that there's multiple headers underneath. Um, so it's almost like there's three different tables within a table. And this is something that we still need to explore how we can, um, if we need to separate the tables in some way um, to make it easier when importing it into some type of CSV uh, data analysis platform. Um, and you can see right here, this is what it looks like in Excel. Um, this is something that we would like to get the opinion on from, you know, from scholars, you know, is this gonna be an issue when um, using this type of data in uh, some type of data analysis platform, uh, whichever uh, you use. Um, so the next steps is um, we do wanna look into converting the maps in ArcGIS, which is the geographic platform. Um, we also wanna look into storing the CSV files into a data repository such as Dryad or Zenodo. This would be open for uh, scholars to download the CSV files. And, and use them however way they, they need to for their research. Um, the last one that we also want to look into is enhancing metadata to include indigenous place names. Uh, as you can see earlier, I shared a table of the Makalune River, but in the metadata, it does not recognize um, or acknowledge the original inhabitants of that area. Um, so next is uh, we want your feedback. Uh, we have a survey to learn more from water scholars, and it's a 10-minute survey that can help us learn more about how the Bending Water Project team may develop a meaningful and accessible project to suit the needs of scholars using water data in their research. Um, this survey should be getting sent out to you in the chat. Um, otherwise, if you go to the Bending Water Project uh, website or the blog, um, we also have the, tape, the, the survey at the bottom of the, of the homepage. Um, another thing about the, the blog, um, if you want to look into what other types of data sets that we are exploring, um, Kenneth Kotick has been writing, publishing blogs um, in our blog called The Deluge. Um, uh, he's basically looking at some of the data that is in there, something that he finds interesting. And um, it also links to the actual uh, California Water Documents collection, and it will link to the record of the data that he's writing about. Um, so that's something I encourage you to explore as well. Um, so thank you again for listening. Um, we are still continuing our outreach efforts to any water or indigenous history scholars. Um, again, you can also contact us uh, at bendingwater at claremont.edu if you have any questions or would like to um, hear back from us. Um, also, if you take the survey, you can also input your email at the very end and we can also contact you that way. And I'll open it up to some questions. Thank you, Catalina and Janine. That was fabulous. It's amazing how much you covered in such a short time. So that was really wonderful. We've got two questions queued up already, the first of which from Annie Davis. Uh, she'd love to know the best way to access these newly available, newly available data sets. Um, they are not available yet, but we will keep you posted. Um, they will likely go into either uh, the Dryad data repository, which we are a subscribing member to. It's an interdisciplinary repository, or possibly Zenodo, 
which is uh, Z-E-N-O-D-O, -O, if you're not familiar with it, it's affiliated with Dryad. Um, but we will be keeping links, uh, there will be links present in the Western Waters Archives page. There will be related materials links in the content DM folder. Our goal is to sort of take these data sets out it's a little tricky because they'll be out of context, right? You'll get a table of this observation and a researcher being a researcher will want more context. So we're going to have that fixed permanent link back to the original item. So scholars can go back and see what report was this? Where did this come from um, exactly? So everything is gonna be linked up with uh, DOIs, fixed indicators. So you can always sort of put those things together. So um, stay tuned, but you'll be able to check in on the Western Waters archives page for sure. Fantastic. And Marcos Huertos has a related question is it, um, that he's just put in. Um, he says, I understand the limits of images, um, but some of the images communicate lots of assumptions that would be lost in converting maps or plots into uh, CSV files. Uh, questions of objectivity, whether object, and he has it in, in quotes, understandably. Um, his experience suggests some don't pay attention to the metadata very carefully or use the data with an agenda that is not, quote, objective. Is there some, I mean, we can't always know how people are going to use this work, but, but it sounds like you're being hyper alert to those kinds of concerns. Can you convey, how can you help Mark resolve his question? Uh, I think um, that's the reason why we are doing this outreach is you know we are still experimenting with the data ourselves and again we need these conversations with water experts and actually learn how are you using the water data because if there are people who would like the images of the charts to be left as images because for example maybe they don't need them to be in some type of you know uh, computational platform or conversion like maybe that isn't needed first for the maps or charts uh, we want those opinions and we want to learn more of, you know, what exactly will benefit you. Um, so again, I think that's where the, the survey is going to come in handy. Um, there is also a comments area at the very end of the survey where you can also um, provide any feedback. Um, again, we would also like to meet with anyone who is interested in um, providing their um, opinions with us and we'd like to, you know, carry on a conversation. Great. Thank you. Um, there are no particular questions for y'all, but we've got a few more minutes. So if um, there are questions for the group uh, collectively, if there are questions uh, for particular speakers who may still be with us this morning, um, no, afternoon, um, fire away. Harold Eaton sends congrats to everyone. A great set of talks, he says. Uh, Tilly Hilton asks, Hinton asks, how is the funding landscape for continuing and extending this work? We're on grants in both cases for clear and bending water. Uh, what seems to be possible in the future to make sure this can be sustainable across time? Janine, Catalina, Lisa, if you want to hop in. I, I'll just, um, I just want to add that as I mentioned earlier in my talk, um, our plans are to continue, our plans, special collections plans, are to continue to digitize materials in our holdings and get them into the Kramer College's digital um, library. Um, the library does at certain times have budgets for student workers, although with the pandemic that was all cut. Um, we're hoping to recover some of those budgets. So there is some funding within the library to continue some of this work. Um, and we'll just also continue to, um, reach out to people or as people reach out to us and apply for additional grant fundings from other sources or open those discussions. In other words, if you know stuff, tell us. It looks like we have no more questions. So my colleagues and I are so grateful to the speakers who joined us today and their fascinating talks to the more than 100 people that at various points were on the webinar this after, morning and afternoon. Um, we are so grateful for your presence, for your questions and for your concerns. And I just have one more, one more question. Uh, Joseph Tomlinson has said that he's developed the concept of coupling flood mitigation with drought mitigation. Um, perhaps Professor Malouf would be a great person for you to chat with, I would suspect. Um, 
and we can get you his email if that's of use to you, Joseph. Um, so to my colleagues and, and friends and folks from near and far, thank you so, so much. Uh, to Brandy and Stephanie, thank you so much for the work that you have done um, on this process. Uh, this has been a remarkable morning and early afternoon, and it probably exceeded everybody's, including ours, anticipation of what one can do on Zoom. It turns out you can do a lot. Thank you again. So yes, the video will be posted again to the Western Water Archives website and it will be available through the Claremont College's Library YouTube channel. Uh, you'll get an email that will give you the links to everything. So please feel free to share it with everyone that you think would be interested, um, you know, with students, um, share it in your classrooms, with colleagues, you know, any way to get the word out to this incredible depth of knowledge that we um, learned about today. Uh, and we do thank everybody for being here and participating so actively in our Q&A and engaging our, our speakers. And if you found anything particularly interesting, um, please also post it to social media using our hashtag Western Water Symposium. Well, thank you. It's been a, a blast joining you today. Uh, thank you again to everybody who was on the panel, who contributed, who asked questions, um, and even those who like absorbed what was uh, being said in, in um, this webinar. Have a good weekend, a safe weekend. If you have a chance to get a vaccine, get it.